Dr. Muhammad is a fellowship trained gastroenterologist and transplant hepatologist here at Advent Health Tampa. He is triple board certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology, and transplant hepatology. Dr. Muhammad will be sharing updates on the incidence, pathophysiology, and current management of fatty liver disease. He is also an associate professor of medicine. Thank you. Dr. Muhammad. Thank you so much, Jazz, for the wonderful introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's excellent to be here and do something which is really good to my heart and very close to my heart. Um, I've been involved in taking care of liver patients for the last 20 years, being a resident and then fellow and then as a faculty here. So it's very uh, humbled and very uh, honored to be here today and welcome all of you for coming here on a Saturday morning, be a part of us in this symposium. This is the first liver symposium. We are here doing it at Ventile Tampa. And thanks to all the organizers, and especially all of you sitting here, of coming this morning. Um, having said that, we have an excellent program. We have a booklet where everything is written for you, all the program timelines and everything. And I also want to thank all the speakers for coming here. With that being said, let's start the first talk, which is fatty liver disease. Uh, this topic uh, is, I think, if you talk to any of the hepatologists 10 years ago, 20 years ago, all they talk about is hepatitis C because it was like a spectrum of diseases and nobody know how to manage it and we had horrible treatments. And now nobody talks about hepatitis C, but we have a presentation for hepatitis C, is also important. But I think the next kid, this is a new kid in the block, which is fatty liver disease. And let's talk about fatty liver disease and, and in the next 20 minutes or so, we will try to learn about the incidence, pathophysiology and the current management guidelines. What do we do with our patients with fatty liver? So most of the slides are taken from this guideline published in the Journal of Hepatology in 2018. So this is four years old, and they have been updated, and I think the new guidelines are coming next year. Uh, so you're going to see more of the slides from this guidelines taken. Uh, I have no financial disclosures uh, pertaining to this talk and no conflict of interest. So we're going to talk about the epidemiology and pathogenesis of fatty liver. We will talk about how to diagnose and treat these patients. And in the end, we will talk about risk stratification and long-term monitoring, because I think that's the key in taking care of these patients. Once you have fatty liver, it doesn't go away, um, which is different than hepatitis C or any other viral hepatitis, because you treat them with the medication and you get rid of them. Once you're diagnosed with fatty liver, it stays with you as a multi-system disease for the rest of your life. So let's talk about the obesity. We know that there's an epidemic of obesity in, in the whole world, actually, and especially in the US. If you look at the right side of the, right side of the slide, so back in 2018, about 42% prevalence was there in the US. And it's been uh, uh, predicted that in the next uh, eight years, 2030, half of the US population will be obese by definition. And we're talking about BMI more than 30. So this is really an eye-opener. And if you look into the different states, the color scheme will tell you um, what's the prevalence of obesity. In, US, in Florida here, it's about 40 to 49% at this point. So very high prevalence. So what's the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic STR2 hepatitis in adults? So if you look at the worldwide prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's about 25%, very high prevalence. One out of four people in the whole world have fatty liver disease, diagnosed or undiagnosed. But if you look at the prevalence of uh, fatty liver disease in type 2 diabetic, it's about 55% such a high prevalence. So if somebody has type 2 diabetes, one out of two of these patients will have fatty liver disease. If you look at the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH, the, their incidence is a little lower, which is about 1.5 to 7%. But if you multiply with more than 6 billion people in the earth, this is a high, big number. Uh, and again, the same thing, the prevalence of steatohepatitis, NASH, is about 37% in diabetics. So the diabetic patients are the real key where they have fatty liver disease, diagnosed or undiagnosed, and these are the patients we have to really focus on. So what's the definition of fatty liver disease? And we classify between the two different types, and this is something very new out of the literature. 
So you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We know these patients never drink alcohol, but they have fatty liver. However, there is a new terminology and entity is coming, which is called MAF-LD, Metabolic Associated Fatty Liver Disease, because essentially these patients, the majority of the patients we see in our practice have metabolic derangements. They have metabolic disorders. So, so you're going to see this nomenclature being used a lot in our practice, which I'm starting using it also, is not NAF-LD, it's MAF-LD. So what is MAF-LD? First, you have to exclude, exclude the things which is on the right of your, uh, on the screen, to make sure that they don't go over the non-metabolic um, causes of fatty liver. Of course, alcohol consumption is number one, we know that. And it says how much uh, drink you have to have in a day to have fatty liver disease um, secondary to alcohol use. We know hepatitis C genotype 3 is another risk factor for fatty liver. We know uh, there are certain medications listed there. They can also cause fatty liver, some genetic disorders, TPN, prolonged use, starvation. All of these things can cause fatty liver. But the most important thing we're going to talk about today is the left side, where we talk about metabolic disorders and have fatty liver disease. So one, if you have obesity, BMI more than 30, uh, BMI actually uh, more than 25, overweight or obesity, then you qualify for metabolic uh, associated liver disease and fatty liver. If you have type 2 diabetes and you have fatty liver disease, you qualify with MAF-LD. However, don't forget that these patients, some of these patients, and the prevalence is about 15 to 25 percent of these patients with fatty liver, they are not obese and they don't have diabetes. They are lean and they are slim, BMI less than 25, but they do have fatty liver disease. Why? Because they have some of the parameters for uh, metabolic disorders, such as high waist circumference, high blood pressure, triglycerides levels are high, low HDL, they're pre-diabetics, they have high HOMA index, and they have high C-reactive protein. So if you are lean and you are not obese, and if you have two, at least two of this metabolic derangement, you also qualify for MAF-LD, based on this new definition of MAF-LD. Now, again, uh, more emphasis on obesity, diabetes, and essentially this is, like the, this is like a trio, which is the worst trio a patient can have when they, have, they are obese, they are diabetic, and they have fatty liver disease. And I will tell you, I will show you a few slides coming up why I'm saying this. But if you look into a little bit about pathophysiology, what happens to this patient with metabolic derangements? They are obese, we know that. And then they have a little bit of hormonal imbalance, such as low adiponectin and high leptin. They have high free fatty acids, which, and they have high inflammatory markers. All of these things causes high insulin resistance, especially in type 2 diabetics. And what happens is that if you have insulin resistance, you have high circulating insulin in your system, you are going to make more lipogenesis. And then these fat tissues will go into the liver. Sorry, go back. Okay, so this fat tissue will go inside the liver and can cause fatty liver disease. And again, if you look into this side here, if you have type 2 diabetes, again, the same thing, hyperinsulinemia, lipogenesis, and NAFLD. But again, what happens that if you have NAFLD, it can also predispose to type 2 diabetes by this circular pathway because you have high free fatty acids, you have more adipose tissue lipolysis, and then it can cause insulin resistance, and of course, goes into the type two diabetes. So these patients actually are trapped in this vicious circle where they have all these pro-inflammatory markers, insulin resistance, high free fatty acid circulation, causing this disease. So when I was telling you that this is so devastating, because this is the reason I'm saying this. If a patient comes to you with fatty liver, don't think that this is just a fatty liver. You know, your liver is fine, is a little inflamed, you have fat in the liver, and you are fine. No, you're not fine, because essentially it involves all the organs of your body. And the most important ones are cardiovascular risk factors and also chronic kidney disease. And this slide basically tells you the pathways, why it happens. If you look into this, they have expanded a dysfunctional adipose tissue, and it can cause directly fat deposition in the kidney, fat deposition into the cardiac thing, causing all these derangements such as cardiovascular disease, aortic um, valve sclerosis, you have cardiac hypertrophy, you have congestive heart failure, arrhythmias, and of course, chronic kidney disease. Now, if you look into this middle part of the slide, these are the inflammatory markers I was telling you earlier. Then they have high inflammatory markers, high triglycerides, CRP, IL-6. 
increase TNF alpha levels, and these pro-inflammatory markers also contribute to this myocardial dysfunction, arrhythmias, and of course, chronic kidney disease. So essentially, and, and, if, and if you look at the literature, these patients, they have, you know, we will talk a little bit more, uh, that they can progress into cirrhosis, portal hypertension, may need a liver transplant on death, but again, at the same time, their mortality is also related to cardiovascular and kidney-related disorders. So remember that when you see a patient with fat liver, to screen them for these diseases also. So what, what is the reason they have fatty liver, right? So the most important thing, if you look into this slide, is that either they have bad diet or they have bad genes. This is where it comes to it eventually. So they have high calorie intake, they have excessive fat in the uh, diet, high fructose, very bad, and of course sedentary behavior. Okay. Obesity leads to fatty liver. And again, there has been a lot of interest about the genetic markers, and these two, there are about 10, 15 genes where the research has been going on, but these two genetic markers are well identified and being studied exclusively, P and PLA3 and TM6SF2. So if you are a carrier of these two genes, you are more likely to have fatty liver disease than the people who are a non-carrier. And the reason behind this, that these genes will increase, lip, decrease the lipolysis, more fat deposition in the liver, decrease your beta oxidation of free fatty acids, and also decrease VLDL secretions. Uh, these genetic markers are not ready for prime time. You cannot order it on a patient, but I'm very hopeful down the road, there's a lot of new things coming up in fatty liver management, and we should be able to screen our patients down the road that they have a bad gene, and they need to start early with their lifestyle modification. Now, uh, uh, I promise this is the last slide of pathogenesis, then we'll go over the clinical side. Uh, but I think this is very important for the audience because you really have to know what happens to this patient at the molecular level so you can treat them better. So as we talked about, these patients are obese, they have diabetes, and they have high fat, visceral fat and adipose tissue fat. What happens that they have derangements and they have, I just told you earlier, they have adipocytokines, increased leptin, decreased uh, adiponectin level. They have hyperinsulinemia, and they have uh, short-chain fatty acids uh, increase. All of these things go to the liver, and then they can start secreting DAX and TAX, triacylglycerol, diacylglycerol, and then they can form into a lipid globulus into the liver and start making steatosis. The first step is fat deposition inside the liver. What else contribute? Look at these slides out here. Same thing in there. High-fat diet, high-carbohydrate, high fructose, and of course, genetic derangement, as I just told you. The other important thing here uh, is that intestinal uh, dysbiosis. This is also being studied extensively in the literature nowadays. And you're going to hear wherever the lecture you go, either it's Alzheimer's disease or cancer, and of course, liver disease, people are talking about gut microbiota. Okay, so the gut microbiota is the new kid in the block where there's a lot of research and there has been association with almost all the disease you can name secondary to derangements of the gut microbiota. And same thing happening over here. You have intestinal dysbiosis. You have change in the gut microbiota because of the diet we take, because of high fructose, high fat content. And then this dysbiosis also promotes the bile acids from the primary to secondary bile acids, and these secondary bile acids are toxic to the liver, and it goes to the inflammation, fibrosis, cirrhosis, cascade, and eventually liver cancer. So very important to remember. So the progression of NAFLD, very important. You have a normal liver, then it goes to steatosis, then it goes to steatohepatitis, and then eventually leads to cirrhosis. So, how do we monitor this patient? If you look into the liver enzyme, yes, liver enzymes can be elevated. We see in my practice, the first consult I see, the first reason for this patient, they come to see me, oh, we, we have high ALT level. Or they do a scan, and scan shows incidental finding of fatty liver. This is how this patient comes to a hepatology practice. But again, this is not a screening test. You can have completely normal liver, you still can have fatty liver disease, okay? So don't forget about that, the metabolic derangements. Uh, and of course, low level of antibodies can happen in these patients. So, 
Why do we talk about fibrosis? Fibrosis is the key here because the fibrosis leads to poor survival, cirrhosis, hepatic decompensation, portal hypertension, eventually death or liver transplantation. And if you look into this slide, the most important thing I want to point is that two and a half years, these patients from F3, which is bridging fibrosis, goes into the stage of F4 cirrhosis. So fibrosis is the key, and this is how you're going to risk stratify these patients. You have fatty liver disease, do you have fibrosis? How much fibrosis you have? What do we do about this? So ASLD guideline still says liver biopsy is the gold standard, all right? So you do a liver biopsy in this patient, you will see fatty liver disease, you're gonna see a lot of steatosis here, you're gonna see steatohepatitis, ballooning of hepatocytes, inflammation and all this thing. And then you can use the NAF, NAF LD activity scoring system, NAS scoring system, and you can from zero to eight, and you can say, you know, this patient has inflammation and fat, and again, you have fibrosis score, I just told you, from zero to four, cirrhosis. But again, liver biopsy, I don't remember when is the last time I did a liver biopsy on a fatty liver patient. We don't do this anymore. This is the gold standard, agreed, but it carries all of these risk factors in there. Invasive, bleeding, perforation, all of those risks. So liver biopsy is the gold standard. Sometimes I do biopsies where the diagnosis is in doubt, but most of the time you don't have to go for biopsy because why? Because of this reason. You have non-invasive testing of the liver disease. And recently all the societies have agreed that this is the way to go. And uh, we're going to move quickly on this one. You have simple scoring systems. You have FIF4, NAFLD scoring system, APRI. And the most important one I'm going to talk about here is FibroScan. We have this technology here at Advent Health, and I will go over this slide. But you can have blood biomarkers, and it can tell you about fibrosis score. You have FIF4 score. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, some of these slides, and I'll be happy to share with all of you uh, if you want. But you have these blood biomarkers. You have NAFLD fibrosis score. You have APRI score, AST over platelets. And then there are biomarkers you can do at the bedside. You can order the lab, and the lab will tell you what fibrosis you have. Uh, fibrosure, ELF score, but this is the important one I want to spend some time. This is FibroScan, which I used exclusively in replaced liver biopsy in our practice here. This is a machine uh, which gives you the fibrosis and uh, steatosis score. This is, uh, uh, this is an outpatient like a sonogram. Patient come fasting two hours, get the scan, 20 minutes, they are out. Nope, no, um, it's non-invasive, purely outpatient, and you're gonna get these two findings in there, okay? You're gonna get the steatosis score, how much fat you have, and you're gonna get a fibrosis score, how much scar tissue you have. And if you look at the sensitivity and specificity, pretty good, right? More than 90%. Of course, it's not 100% because there is nothing, you're not even liver biopsy is 100% because biopsy can be patchy, right? This is scanning the whole liver. So again, this is an excellent non-invasive tool to risk stratify your patients with fatty liver. I use exclusively in my patients with fatty liver, and this can be used as initial diagnosis and then prognosis and a follow-up. I scan them every six months or a year to find out if the weight loss or any other uh, stuff for fatty liver is working or not. Now, let's, next five minutes, let's go over the treatment of NASH. So the goal of the treatment is twofold, right? You have to reverse or halt the fibrosis and prevent progression into cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Most important key, when a patient comes to me, they don't want to hear this, right? Because everybody has told them. But I still tell them, lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification is the key. Unless you do lifestyle modification, nothing will work, okay? No medication will work. So diet restrictions, Caffeine actually has been researched and has been shown that is antifibrotic activity. So we also say, you know, if you are a coffee drinker, one or two, three cups are fine. But these are black coffees. These are not caramel macchiato, tall, grande, <laughs> with a lot of whipped cream on it, okay? So that's not the one we're talking about. We're talking about a black coffee here. And of course, physical, physical activities are here, fructose intake decrease, alcohol stop, and of course, diet, diet modification, very important. There is no FDA-approved treatment for the patients of fatty liver disease. As of now, there is no FDA-approved drug for fatty liver disease. Now, these are the options we can use in this patient, vitamin E and Oh, there it is. Vitamin E and pioglitazone has been extensively used, uh, and I use it in my practice. We can use in patients uh, with or without diabetes, biopsy-proven cirrhosis as per the guidelines. Now, metformin, 
ursodiol, statins, omega, orlistat, okaleva, which is a uh, obeticolic acid, they are not recommended at this point, not recommended. And of course, there's a lot of research of the new drugs we can talk in the next few minutes. Bariatric surgery, I'm not gonna talk too much about it. I just put one slide, uh, and my colleague here, Dr. Murray, will, uh, will have another talk on bariatric, but the most important thing out of the slide, yes, bariatric surgery is an option of treatment for this patient for fatty liver disease if they qualify otherwise. So if they qualify otherwise, definitely go ahead for bariatric surgery. And, and if you look at the first line on this, we have excellent data out there, right? So improve in the, in the steatohepatitis, almost 80% in a year, and fibrosis, uh, 33%. So uh, these are the targets for the drug developments in NASH. So if you look into the big list over here, these are the molecules, actually. They are being researched, some of them in phase two, some of them in phase three, and they target different parts of the liver and they are targeting on the triglycerides, free fatty acids, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, apoptosis, fibrosis, uh, free fatty acids, bile acids. So these are the molecules, actually. They are in the, pri in, in the research now, and I have, I think, two slides left. Um, so these are the drug trials in the NASH. So, the, you know, five years ago, if you ask me, there were about 20, 25 drugs in the pipeline uh, being studied, but the unfortunate thing is a lot of drugs will, uh, will leave and they don't meet the requirements. So these studies are already terminated, but I want to uh, focus on three or four things here and then we'll close. This is a very promising drug right here, FXR agonist, okay? This is obeticolic acid, Okaleva, which is now approved for the treatment of patient with PBC, primary bariatric cholangitis, but they have been studied. They are in phase three trial. Regenerate is the name of the study. They have thousands of patients, and the initial preliminary data published few months ago shows their efficacy, and they met the endpoint target, which is regression of fibrosis without worsening of steatohepatitis. So they are going to FDA for a new drug, um, a new drug authorization, and I'm very hopeful that in the next year, hopefully, or not if 2024, we will have some target molecules available to treat these patients with NASH. So FXR agonist is, a, is, is very promising here. The second one is GLP-1 agonist. These are the, the, uh, our patients with type 2 diabetes or even type 1. Um, GLP-1 agonist, liraglutide, and semaglutide is now in phase two trials and shows promising uh, um, uh, in the patient with fatty liver disease, decreasing the fat content and improving the insulin resistance. And, um, uh, and then the last one here is uh, TSH beta agonist um, resmetrom, and this is also in phase two trial. So, so hopefully in the next few years, we will have new drugs coming out. This is my last slide, and I will close with this. So just to summarize what we have talked about today, right? So we have ASLD guidelines, we have European Association guidelines, and we have Asia, Asia Pacific guidelines. So the most important thing, routine screening is still not recommended because it's all about cost effectiveness. But again, if you have a high risk patient, please screen them for fatty liver disease. Next thing are, these are the fibrosis assessment. Once you screen these patients, they have fatty liver, you have to go towards their risk stratification with their fibrosis. You can use non-invasive markers. Fibro scan is an excellent tool. Liver biopsy is the gold standard, but not being done recently. Treatment is lifestyle modification. Weight loss is very important. Low calorie diet, exercise, get out of the couch, work out. Weight loss, very important. Now, no FDA-approved treatment drug, as I told you, but a lot of drugs are in phase three. Hopefully, we'll have something in the pipeline. Vitamin E, pyoglutazone can be used. And with this, I will close. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions at the Q&A session. Thank you. I'd like to next introduce Dr. Lisa Ferreira. Dr. Ferreira is double board certified in obesity medicine and family medicine. She is also an active member of the Obesity Medicine Association, the American Society for Met Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and the American Academy of Family Physicians. At Advent Health Tampa, Dr. Ferreira delivers personalized weight management programs to help her patients meet healthy weight goals. Please help me welcome her to the podium to discuss the role of medical weight management in the treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Thank you, Dr. Ferreira. 
Thank you so much. I get some clapping. Thank you. Everybody's awake now. That's great. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today to talk to you about medical weight management in the treatment of NAFLD. And I think we got just a beautiful presentation from Dr. Muhammad. So he basically said all I need to say. So uh, it's been nice seeing you guys. I'm going to go get coffee. Um, <laughs> that was very thorough. That was wonderful. So you really did the heavy lifting on a lot of that. So I can kind of skip through. So this is great. All right, so I have no disclosures, although we are going to talk a little bit more about uh, off-label medication use potentially for treatment of NAFL. And so we're going to define obesity. We're going to start there because we know that that is really the, the uh, main thing we need to tackle when we're looking at NAFL. It's lifestyle modification, it's weight loss, and, and the link to obesity is very significant. Um, we're going to talk about some treatment options and potentially medication options. So I just wanted to define obesity. The Obesity Medicine Association um, created this beautiful definition of what exactly is obesity. And so it is, as we know, a chronic, progressive, relapsing, and treatable disease. We know this is a chronic disease. We see this in our patients. Uh, we see their struggle. We see them lose weight, regain, lose weight, regain, and struggle. We also know that um, this promotes adipose tissue dysfunction, and that's really what we're talking about with NAFLD as well, is the, the metabolic changes that happen, and so that can certainly happen with obesity. The prevalence of obesity, we talked about this as of 2020, about 42% of our U.S. adults are suffering from obesity, and about three-quarters of our population has obesity or overweight. So we, we really do need to tackle this main cause of a lot of our medical conditions these days. We're also seeing about 9% of our U.S. adults are classified as having severe obesity. So that's a body mass index um, greater than or equal to 40. And over two-thirds of our patients diagnosed with NAFLD have obesity. Three-quarters of those have NASH, you know, uh, patients diagnosed with NASH have obesity. So we really need to tackle obesity. So I am going to really be able to buzz through these, pathophysiology. But uh, I did just want to put up uh, this slide about the multifactorial nature of these conditions. And they really do overlap. Genetics, epigenetics, neurobehavioral, endocrine, medical. There are so many reasons that patients are struggling with obesity and NAFLD. Common causes, so we alluded to the genetics. So the PNPLA3, the um, I148M, so it's an isoleucine to methionine um, substitution, and that's, we think, the major inherited determinant. Um, interestingly, a study showed that patients who do have that abnormality may actually respond better to lifestyle modification. So when we get ahead to treatment, in the future when we can identify this gene, it may really help us figure out who is going to respond to what therapies. Epigenetics, that is the process that alters gene activity. So it does not change the DNA, but it is um, when the, the expression of those genes are changed from usually um, fetal exposure. So specifically for NAFLD, they find that fetal exposure to a high-fat diet may predispose patients to that. Um, we know another common cause, absolutely, obesity and adiposopathy, and we'll get into that further, but uh, basically we're looking at insulin resistance. And that's why we're seeing this as a metabolic disease. And I think that the name change is a great idea because it really gets to the reason that we are um, struggling. It's not non-alcohol. It should be really thought of as a metabolic disease. And also those free, uh, free fatty acids that are circulating. So uh, again, thank you for all the mechanisms because then I don't have to go through that. Um, and then the, uh, we think that diet, of course, uh, diet and activity are certainly related to this, and we'll talk about that further. Uh, but specifically, studies are showing saturated fat, but I would argue even more so sugar, 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 added sugar, fructose specifically. And we'll uh, buzz through some medications. So I did just want to put up this slide about the um, lipid metabolism in a, a normal functioning adipocyte. So um, this adiposopathy, though, refers to sick fat disease or sick adipose tissue. So in the face of obesity or insulin resistance, we know this adipocyte is not functioning properly. So we see that, I'm going to find my pointer here, here we go. Uh, we see that with obesity and insulin resistance, this adipocyte actually does not take in the free fatty acids it's supposed to, so you have increased circulating free fatty acids. There's a decrease in the lipoprotein lipase enzyme here, 
And we also see the storage of the triglycerides, the lipolysis actually increases, and so we get an increased release of free fatty acids. So we're not taking as many in for storage, and we're releasing too many. So that's going to lead to increased uh, circulating free fatty acids to the liver. There was also a study recently, interestingly, out of um, Italy, I believe, that just this month showed that while we can't really, uh, we don't have great markers right now, what we may be able to do is start looking at our lipid panels as an easy way to determine which patients might be at risk and look at the triglyceride to HDL ratio. This is a, a part of our cholesterol panel that we get very simply, cheap test, everyone has it. It looks like if you look at this ratio for patients, a ratio of greater than about a 1.64 in this study was um, predictable for the development of NAFLD or the presence of NAFLD. So this may be one of our easy tests. And Dr. Muhammad alluded to, it doesn't have to be necessarily patients who suffer from obesity. We are missing some of these patients who are actually considered normal weight based on BMI. But this might be a good way to identify those patients. So management. We provide a comprehensive approach for obesity. Uh, we need to look at all of these different areas because it is really lifestyle modification. So we're looking at nutrition, behavioral modification, physical activity. You know, the top part of this is our lifestyle modification. We also are going to allude to some medications. And then Dr. Moore is going to give a beautiful talk on bariatric procedures. So I also wanted to put this up as well, because the only thing that changes really when we talk about treatment for NAFLD is this term. It's exactly the same as the obesity slide. So it's, the treatment is the same. So our weight goals, as Dr. Mohammed mentioned, a, just a 3 to 5% total body weight loss can really improve hepatic steatosis. You know, it, it doesn't sound like much, but it really does make a metabolic difference. Studies have shown, though, over a 10% total body weight loss can actually induce near universal NASH resolution and can improve fibrosis. So these patients maybe are not doomed if we can get enough weight loss. But we're really targeting about a 7 to 10% weight loss. That's what we're looking for with our lifestyle interventions. And we also want to make sure we're promoting the uh, weight loss, but we're also preventing regain, and we're promoting weight maintenance. You know, we can, I believe, reverse fatty liver, but it's going to come back as the weight comes back. And again, as we talked about with the obesity definition, it's a relapsing condition. So this is chronic management as well. I just wanted to put up the um, obesity treatment pyramid. So this is basically where we start when we're looking at treatment of obesity, lifestyle modification. We really try that for all of our patients, and we'll get into that a little further. But we can expect maybe 2 to 5% weight loss, depending on the person. Not downplaying that. That's wonderful, absolutely. But there are other things in our treatment pyramid of obesity that can be more effective. And um, so we are now looking at pharmacotherapy because we can expect for many patients, up to a 20% weight loss, which is amazing. OK, nutrition, I'm going to buzz through these. Um, so basically, the, the basics on nutrition. I have patients come in all the time, and they say, well, what diet? Tell me what I'm supposed to eat. Am I supposed to be counting calories? What am I supposed to do? Guidelines are quick and easy. You can tell your patients, added sugar, added sugar, added sugar, added sugar. Avoid it as best as you can. You can't, it, obviously, we live in America, we can't avoid added sugar, but we can try to limit sugar. We can limit the ultra-processed foods, junk foods, cakes, candies, cookies, all the basic stuff we think about. Um, we also think maybe processed meats, um, so added chemicals. You know, it boils down to processed food can really um, can cause a problem, can make a difference. Energy-dense foods. I know a lot of our patients are stopping through Starbucks, and they're stopping getting their muffin, and they're not paying attention to the labels and exactly how much they're getting in their foods. Um, avoiding trans fats, um, artificial sweeteners. That's been a, a hot topic and interesting. Um, lots of studies coming out to decide are they good, are they bad. You know, if we're looking at avoiding added sugar, then and fructose specifically, which is the, the demon here, then yeah, um, if they have to do that, then that might be an option. A recent study came out in uh, the journal Cell 
which actually showed that possibly aspartame and stevia, so the blue and green is how I remember them, may not actually change blood sugar, but the other artificial sweeteners may actually increase blood sugar. And so again, when we're looking at the link between our metabolic diseases, diabetes, um, fatty liver, obesity, we really think this all comes down to insulin resistance and, um, and controlling blood sugar. So we're gonna encourage our healthy proteins, we're gonna encourage our uh, monounsaturated fats, but basically, Simple, real foods, no added sugars, no added high fructose corn syrup, sports drinks. I mean, there's so many different things. And increasing fiber can really be helpful too. And this is just for obesity, but you'll see the overlap here as well. Same thing for NAFLD. Ultra-processed carbohydrates can really be a problem. High fat, high sugar. You know, I would argue that the sugar is really where we need to focus our energy with patients. Uh, Sugar-sweetened beverages, especially our kids. Sports drinks are all over the place. Sports drinks are made by Coca-Cola. So not, I was having this argument with my teenage son the other day. Oh. Um, we also think maybe snacking between meals might actually cause a problem. Um, the higher levels of insulin that are circulating more consistently throughout the day may actually increase insulin resistance as well. So encouraging, again, plant-based proteins, lean meats, whole grains, higher fiber, less added sugar. Um, Dr. Muhammad alluded to coffee consumption. I'm a coffee drinker, so I was glad to see that. Uh, up to even four cups a day, yay, um, can have a beneficial effect on fibrosis. Not as much steatosis in this one study, but, but fibrosis, absolutely. Um, moderate alcohol, there's been discussion about that. The, the um, resveratrol in wine, uh, maybe one to two drinks per day if there's no Nash or cirrhosis. So if we're looking at early NAFLD, then that would maybe be appropriate. So Mediterranean diet actually is, is shown to be the diet that fits that description. You know, we have all of these dietary approaches. Patients come in saying they want to try paleo and DASH and Ornish and all this stuff, um, Atkins and keto, and you know, what do you tell your patients to do? And the bottom line is really sugar, sugar. And any of these diets can really fit into that um, lower sugar approach, but specifically the Mediterranean diet. So Mediterranean diet is usually characterized by avoiding processed foods, specifically added sugars, processed carbohydrates, um, decreases saturated fats, and specifically, or especially trans fats, we want to avoid those, um, moderate consumption of seafood, lean meats, um, vegetables, you know, just getting back to basics, getting back to basics, getting rid of all of the fast food, microwavable, you know, I, I, I talk to my kids about read labels, read labels and look at what's in the food. It's hard for a 17-year-old to do that with his Gatorade, but um, it's just amazing the stuff that's in our food. So back to basics. Specifically fructose, I wanted to take a minute just to talk about that because fructose is really, we think, the, the majority of the issue. You know, fructose, our body, we only store it in the liver and, and store it as fat, so it, it doesn't have any nutritive value. There's no real reason to have it. Added sugar, table sugar, sucrose, is half glucose, half fructose. Uh, high fructose corn syrup, added into everything. And we think that, that fructose actually causes uh, increased hepatic synthesis of triglycerides, Changes that microflora, the intestinal microbiota that we're talking about these days. That's, again, the hot topic, absolutely. Increases gut permeability, increases inflammatory markers, tumor necrosis factor, can maybe increase uric acid production. Again, uh, contributing to insulin resistance, oxidative stressors. Um, it also does not shut off ghrelin, uh, interestingly. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. So your brain gets a signal from ghrelin saying, I'm hungry, I go, need to go eat more. And so this does not help shut that off. Usually when you eat, you're supposed to decrease your ghrelin so you feel full. Also, we think fructose may actually stimulate what we call hedonic eating. So it's those food cravings, those, those thoughts of food, the emotional eating. Fructose really, really um, gets to that. And whereas natural fruit, so natural fruit is also glucose and fructose, but it's covered in fiber. So we think that that protects it from uh, a lot of absorption from the gut. So we don't see the same issue with natural fruit. So added sugars, added fructose. If I could leave you with one thing, fructose. Okay, physical activity, I'm gonna blast through these because I am running behind. Um, but basically, it's any activity. You know, we talk about just the need to be moving. Uh, we talked about sedentary behavior. That's just get up and move, do anything. Anything counts. The more you sit, the more you have an increased metabolic risk. Um, we talk about NEAT, uh, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, fidgeting. You know, we try to stop people from fidgeting. We love fidgeting. Fidgeting keeps people moving. But exercise specifically also, we don't even have to have weight loss. We can have a 20 to 30% reduction in our intrahepatic lipids just from exercise by itself. Improves insulin sensitivity and uh, decreases hepatic 
uh, de novo lipogenesis. So activity goals, we just want people doing steps. We would love to see you moving 150 minutes a week. So 30 minutes, five times a week would be wonderful, but anything helps. Resistance training is helpful as well. Uh, pharmacotherapy, real quick. So um, with our pharmacotherapy these days, we're really getting advanced and we are able to help our patients make these lifestyle adjustments because we're helping with these hunger hormones, we're helping with satiety, we're helping with their emotional eating. So really, our weight loss medications you know, can give us a 5 to 10% or even if we get a 5 to 10% benefit, we know we can improve our fat mass disease and our um, metabolic changes. Uh, we're not using them nearly enough. This slide shows that. Patients who have diabetes, about, this was an old slide, 2016, but at that time, 8.4% of our population, now it's closer to 9.5, almost 10. But our patients, 86% of those are getting medications for diabetes, whereas now, this is even off, it's more than half, I'm sure, but only about 2% of our patients who qualify for anti-obesity medications are actually getting them. Here's just a quick slide of all of the FDA-approved ones. I know it's very busy, but this is a good reference for the approved anti-obesity medications, because again, if we can treat obesity, we can treat fatty liver. Efficacy of our pharmacotherapy these days, and this one's really interesting. We're really excited about terzepatide in the field of obesity medicine. We can see, because of the weight loss effect, I mean, this is the amount of weight loss, uh, total body weight over placebo, but it is really a, a hot area of investigation right now. Dr. Muhammad also alluded to medications coming down the pipeline. You know, our GLP-1 agonists and our GLP-1 GIP are really showing promise. So yes, of course, there is no FDA-approved pharmacotherapy at this point. Um, again, like Dr. Muhammad spoke about, the, the, these therapies are an investigation. Pioglitazone has been thought to be helpful, but I think only because it increases insulin sensitivity, but it also does cause weight gain. So not my choice for treating this. I'm treating patients with weight loss, lifestyle modification, get rid of the added sugars, let's get you moving some, and let's think about do we want to add in some of our um, newer medications. The study was done in 2020, semaglutide and NASH, and did show that we have a higher percentage of patients with NASH, NASH resolution than placebo using semaglutide. So um, a phase two trial, as, as Dr. Muhammad mentioned. So lots of trials in this area. Trisepatide, again, love it. We love it. And can't wait for it to come out in the obesity um, world as a, an anti-obesity medication specifically. It's currently approved for type 2 diabetes. Again, getting to the root of our problem, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, but it also contributes to a lot of weight loss. Um, so we know that um, the trisepatide trials showed that you can really improve these biomarkers, and this is just a quick slide about ALT, AST. Um, basically, the, the solid blue line is showing the maximum dose of trisepatide and you can see improvement in all of these over placebo line here. And the red is even um, dulaglutide. So, um, and this one is adiponectin. And so we do want to see adiponectin go up in healthier livers. So all of these were favorable bio biomarkers. And just a quick slide about obesity promoting medications. I want everyone to be aware, and I shout this from the rooftops. If anything at all we can do is we can also look at our, anti or our medications that we prescribe patients every day that causes obesity and so, or promotes obesity. The, um, so like Dr. Muhammad had mentioned, valproic acid, I see a lot of glucocorticoids, I see a lot of um, gabapentin. Oh, if I could get rid of gabapentin, steroids, and insulin, that would be awesome. Um, <laughs> amiodarone does promote NAFLD, but doesn't necessarily promote obesity, so we don't uh, think about that one so much. But paroxetine, oh, they're the big four, I see everyone coming in. Hormones, uh, chemotherapy agents, Okay. So in conclusion, weight loss of even 3 to 5% can really be beneficial. Our goal is 7 to 10%. I feel we can really achieve that, especially with a multidisciplinary approach, working with our patients chronically, helping them with these lifestyle changes, and incorporating pharmacotherapy when we can. Um, treatment obviously begins with our ultra-processed, getting rid of these ultra-processed carbs, added sugars. Ugh, my goodness. Uh, but yes, we know there's no FDA-approved pharmacotherapy treatment. And I just wanted to bring this up as well. The Obesity Medicine Association is a very wonderful organization to help guide us on treatment of obesity. They pr have started a journal called Obesity Pillars. It's a free journal to anyone. It has our clinical practice standards on how to treat obesity in so many different areas. I, a lot of my slides were from their uh, reference on NAFLD and obesity treatment, their clinical practice standard. And um, there's an obesity, alg obesity algorithm to help walk you through exactly what do we do to treat obesity.
And that's it. Thank you. introduce Dr. Michelle Moore. Dr. Moore is certified by the American Board of Surgery and specializes in bariatric surgery. For over 30 years, he's been dedicated to providing cutting edge treatment and progressing legislators to encourage insurance companies and employers to support comprehensive obesity management. We are very thankful for that. Today, he will be discussing surgical options as treatments for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Dr. Moore. So I'm going to change that, right? 30 years is a long time, <laughs> right? And um, all right, so I think I'm going to change my talk to, instead of naffled, we're going to say baffled. <laughs> baffled, like bariatric associated fatty liver disease. <laughs> all right, so in, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you a, a synopsis of what I've been doing for the last 20 years, figuring out what to do with fatty liver. Now, um, we were not that smart many years ago, right? This is what I see in the OR every day. And those livers did not look right. We're operating on patients for uh, obesity, and you know these are patients with a BMI 40 and above. And those livers did not look right to me. And I said, what is it, wh what's in that liver that doesn't look right? And I started doing biopsies on livers that didn't look all right, like you know, enlarged fatty you know, livers, and then we picked up a lot of uh, information from that. And many years ago, I ran a study to see if a routine liver biopsy during surgery would give us additional information than just you know looking at the liver and say, well, this is okay, this is not okay. And what I learned from that study is we picked up a lot of uh, moderate to severe um, steatohepatitis. So you cannot tell steatohepatitis by looking at the liver, so the biopsies were very helpful. And we continued this work with my partners and what we learned over uh, the many years to come in about 660 biopsies. Uh, that was uh, unbelievable information we gathered, right? And the take home uh, message from this is only 4% of patients who come to bariatric surgery have normal liver architecture. The other 96% have a lot of problems. And the uh, other uh, information that was very helpful in opening our eyes to this is 9% of patients who come to bariatric surgery have undiagnosed cirrhosis and fibrosis. Now, I didn't know what to do with them, right? So I went up to all my friends in GI and said, hey, we're going to figure this out. The remaining uh, 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 number of patients were, uh, had either steatosis or just simple steatohepatitis. So that was an eye-opener. And we said, well, if we are finding um, fatty liver and fibrosis, what happens to that after weight loss? And nobody had an answer. Everybody told me that it's going to get better, but there was no proof in the literature. And I said, okay, well, we're going to start another study for the next 15, 20 years to figure out what happens to these livers after weight loss. And uh, we ran a study for about 15 years, and the aim was to determine the impact of bariatric surgery on uh, NAFLD, soon to be called BAFLD. Okay? All right. And, uh, well, we, we did a lot of uh, true cut biopsies during bariatric surgery. This, these are data collected uh, between 98 and 2013. I was in high school in 1998, okay? But it's, it's not that 30 years, uh, Jazz. All right. Uh, so, um, uh, and then a lot of patients came back. These were, uh, were doing open surgery, so they came back either for bowel obstruction or hernias for all other reasons, and I took liver biopsies on their follow-up uh, visit and... Um, uh, operations. And we collected quite a bit of this. We had two blinded pathologists to look at these data and classify them according to the Brunt method. So steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis were uh, graded on each of these biopsies by two different pathologists. And the data is as follows. We had 160 patients, and I want to tell you this is the largest series in the universe of before and after bariatric surgery when we published it. Uh, the interval between surgery and biopsies meaning the first and the follow-up biopsy was about 31 months, age is about 47 uh, years, and typically the bariatric cohort is mostly women, so that's about 84%. And the excess body weight loss, that's the measure we used then, was 62. This is a very good representative cohort of patients whose 
uh, BMI is high and undergo surgery and lose weight. Um, so we, I'm going to talk to you th about the results. I'm going to break them down. So steatosis um, reduced from 77% to about 20% in this cohort. Uh, inflammation almost disappeared. Steatohepatitis went from 26% and all these biopsies to about 3%. The shocker, which I was like happy to see also, was fibrosis. Fibrosis was very prevalent, 65% of the time, different stages, and it uh, decreased to 36% after bariatric surgery. Now we said, look, when we went to medical school, right, they said fibrosis is irreversible, and we said, mm, let's learn about this a little bit more. And we pulled all these slides. I'm going to show you a couple uh, before and after bariatric surgery. So on the uh, Left-hand side of the screen is before surgery. This is after steatosis completely resolved in the after uh, biopsies. This one is more representative of steatosis and hepatitis, meaning there are a lot of inflammatory cells in the dense liver tissue, and on the right side, that completely resolved. And as you can tell, if you looked at slides before, on this one on the left, there are, this is a trichrome stain. It stains fibrosis. I mean, this is a bridging fibrosis and a lot of things. And on the right side is a frozen um, biopsy, frozen section examination of that liver uh, after surgery, and the fibrosis has resolved completely. That little thing in the center is an artifact uh, from that uh, frozen section. So now we have, uh, you know, evidence that maybe a fibrosis resolves after uh, bariatric surgery and weight loss. And we wanted to uh, look at a couple of other things. So I'm going to talk to you about stage migration. And we can't say this in liver, but it's like more in cancer. But let's just say it anyway, right? Uh, so the most important part is steatosis resolved in the majority of patients. Fibrosis completely uh, uh, was reversed uh, just by weight loss. And in uh, fibrosis, it improved on about 56%, stayed the same about 25% and got worse by in 16% of the patient. Those are very small numbers, that 16%, but the idea here is we're able to reverse or halt the progression of the disease with weight loss. And that was just phenomenal information that we learned. I you know, got very excited about this. And we went back to the question, well, is it truly reversible? So I couldn't give you a talk. I could not give the hepatologist a talk about this based on my data, so we collected all the data from the entire universe and did a systematic review on all patients who had before and after liver biopsies. There were about uh, 2,400, and um, there were multiple studies, right? So some of them had bypasses, some of them had gastric sleeves, some of them had uh, bands and combination of the above. And that data was also representative of the patients we do. The mean age was about 42, the mean BMI was 48, so it's fair representative of a bariatric population. And to sum it up, look, I wrote that paper and I don't understand this forest plot, right? The statisticians looked at it and said, um, it gets better. But the idea is, is that thromboid thing at the bottom is to that side, that means that's a positive influence and it resolves uh, uh, NAFLD and NASH and baffled and maffled. All right. Now, uh, so to break it down for us to understand it, uh, steatosis is dissolved in 86% uh, of the time, steatohepatitis in 59% of the time, and fibrosis in about 36% of the time. And these are the confidence intervals on the right side. So what that tells us, what that told us, was you've seen uh, improvement, and now we can confirm it with a meta-analysis. So there's, it, there's an understanding uh, now that uh, bariatric surgery improves uh, NASH and NAFLD. Well, uh, that wasn't enough, all right? So I have a lot of skeptical people in the audience, and I say, well, how can you prove that? And I had the dubious distinction of having the largest colony of fat rats in the VA, Parsad. That's, that's on with Rakita and company, right? So we took, um, we took um, regular you know, rats and fed them half-fed diet. If you worked with animal, uh, and, and with rats in the lab, they don't eat fat, right? Their, their diet is high fiber and everything else. So the rats didn't like that fat at all, but we kept it 60% with some fructose in it. And the rat on the left is an adult, about 400 grams. The rat on the right is about 530. So that's about 30% increase in body weight. And uh, that's the weight um, add, uh, the, the obesity trajectory, the uh, body weight trajectory of these patients. 
uh, rice, excuse me, and then uh, this is um, regular food and this is high fat diet. And of course, we biopsied their livers. And uh, the, um, this is normal chow, normal diet and high fat. And you can see the characteristics, uh, deposits of fat and inflammatory cells. And um, of course, uh, we did bariatric surgery on these rats. We did gastric bypasses. Don't ask how. I had a pediatric surgery. I had a pediatric surgery fellow that drew right out, uh, John and John Paul, did all these um, uh, bypasses, right? And the weight loss trajectory, all right? The weight loss trajectory is very similar to what happens in humans. Uh, rapid weight loss in the first two weeks, that's one to two years in humans. It uh, ticks off a little bit here because of additional lean mass and uh, is sustained for a long time. Rats lost weight from surgery, but these were the ones that we maintained, uh, sham rats, and you could see the difference um, many weeks uh, after surgery. And of course, we biopsied these livers, and here's what we saw. Normal diet, high-fat diet, those, patients, those rats, excuse me, had surgery and had bypasses, and the histology reversed to normal. So now we have evidence in, in front of our eyes that's a um, animal model for obesity in NASH and a way to reverse it. All right. I'm going to finish with this slide, okay? And this is going to get on your boards uh, in 10 years from now. Yeah. So these are, this is a summation of all the molecular pathways that we described in the lab. Uh, so in these models, um, obesity increased TNF in the adipose tissue compartment and decreased adiponectin. Adiponectin is something good. So when you decrease it, that's really bad. And that, for the first time, we described adiponectin R2 receptors on the liver cells, and that is decreased too. That interaction between adipose and liver led to decrease in two key metabolic regulators, SIRT1 and AMPK, which led to lipogenesis and, of course, hepatic inflammation. These are the two molecular marker, uh, um, regulators in the cell. And uh, the histological features, of course, is steatosis and steatohepatitis. So that's um, how we describe why fatty liver causes all these troubles and the molecular pathways. And the good news about this is gastric bypass reverses fatty liver and reverses all these um, metabolic pathways. This is all you need to remember uh, from, from, uh, uh, from that uh, talk. In summary, uh, NAFLD is very common in patients with obesity, and we've seen evidence from uh, multiple studies. Uh, NASH can progress to cirrhosis and should be treated. I think Dr. Mohammed emphasized that, and I say the same, the inflection point. We have to intervene and uh, uh, take the uh, inflammation out of the liver. Uh, liver biopsies distinguishes NAS from steatosis, and that was something we learned we didn't know before. And now, instead of us doing repeat liver biopsies after surgery, we send it to Dr. Mohammed. He puts the fiber scan and treats them as such. Uh, bariatric surgery improved histological features of uh, NAFLD and NASH. I'm going to change that to MAFLD. MAFLD is good. Um, BAFLD is uh, amazing, right? And then I'm going to take issue with uh, what you said earlier. I think bariatric surgery should be considered in patients with an AFLD and obesity. I'm going to stop here, and I think we have question and answer session after this. Thank you so much. So to kick off our second session of the day, I'd like to introduce Dr. Angelo Fernandez. Dr. Fernandez is board certified in gastroenterology by the American Board of Internal Medicine. With over 20 years of experience, he brings considerable expertise to our Digestive Health Institute at Advent Health. Today, he will provide an update on the diagnosis and treatment of hepatitis C. Dr. Fernandez. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Jasmine. Um, and thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for inviting me to speak. Um, it's a pleasure. So um, I'm here to talk about um, um, hepatitis C. And um, uh, even though this is not as trendy as uh, NASH, it's still an important topic. Um, most of the information on my talk comes from um, 
this publication uh, that's available online uh, under hcvguidelines.org. And it's um, a publication by uh, the American Association uh, for the Study of Liver Diseases and also uh, the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, and it's um, an evolving publication that's constantly updated, uh, very useful for that practitioner. Uh, so goals and objectives is to uh, basically understand the uh, risk factors for infection and progression to cirrhosis uh, from chronic hepatitis C um, infection, uh, to emphasize the need for prevention and treatment of hepatitis C, and also to become familiarized with the new simplified treatment protocols uh, with the new uh, direct agent, uh, direct acting antiviral agents uh, that we have available. Um, some basic facts about hepatitis C. Uh, it's a viral infection that can lead to chronic liver disease. Uh, about 2.7 million uh, people in the United States affected by it, and uh, over 70 million uh, worldwide. Um, hepatitis C is an RNA virus, uh, which was discovered in 1989. Prior to that, it was commonly known as hepatitis non-A, non-B. Uh, genotypes 1 to 6 are the most common. Uh, genotype 1 accounts for about 75% uh, of the infections um, in this country. Um, it is an RNA virus, so it does not integrate uh, into the nuclei of uh, infected cells, unlike hepatitis B. Um, hepatitis C is the most common uh, bloodborne infection um, in the United States. Uh, there is an associated risk uh, uh, for mortality, no vaccine available, and uh, the silver lining is that hepatitis C is uh, curable with currently available uh, therapies. Uh, the distribution of hepatitis C is uh, broad, uh, worldwide, uh, ranges from less than 1% uh, in some countries to uh, greater than 10% uh, uh, in some um, uh, countries around the world. The as I alluded before, the most common genotype in the United States uh, is genotype uh, uh, 1. Genotype 1A is about half of the infections in this country, and uh, 1A, and 1B is the second most common. And around the world, that's uh, genotype 1 is the most common, except for um, Africa, um, Central Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East, which genotype 4 predominates. Um, some of the um, prevalence of hepatitis C in some uh, groups, uh, obviously recipients of clotting factors made before the virus was discovered in 1987, uh, very high, 85%, uh, 85% uh, 80 in inf uh, injection drug users. Um, hemodialysis is also a risk factor. Um, in children, uh, vertical transmission uh, is the uh, uh, most common um, cause of hepatitis C. Uh, about 5% of uh, um, infants born to uh, a mother with active hepatitis C uh, will develop uh, chronic hepatitis C. And if there is co-infection with hepatitis C and HIV, that risk doubles. Uh, in select populations in this country, uh, there is um, very high rates of hepatitis C, much higher than in the um, um, average population. So incarcerated uh, uh, individuals, um, IV drug users, it's very high, uh, up to 90 percent. Uh, alcoholics, homelessness, uh, people uh, living below the poverty level. Um, so regarding screening for uh, hepatitis C. So um, the 75% uh, of patients with hepatitis C, uh, they were, you know, from the baby boomer generation. Uh, uh, but recently, due to the opioid um, epidemic in this country, um, the rates of uh, acute infection uh, since uh, about 2016 or so um, have uh, 
actually, I'm sorry, since 2009 or 2010, uh, the bulk of the acute infections in this country um, are really between the ages of 20 uh, to 39. So we have a second peak now of um, people with hepatitis C. We're seeing a second uh, epidemic now. Uh, the screening guidelines for hepatitis C. Uh, so uh, there are different organizations and they have um, uh, different guidelines. The CDC recommends testing every adult at least once, uh, testing every pregnant woman uh, during every pregnancy, and then everyone else with uh, risk factors for uh, chronic hepatitis C. Uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, recommends, again, testing every adult from the age of 18 to 79. Uh, also recommend testing every pregnant woman, but they do not specify during each pregnancy. Uh, and they also recommend uh, considering testing pregnant women under the age of 18. Uh, the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease recommends, again, screening all the adults. Periodic testing for those with uh, risk factors, uh, and then annual testing for uh, persons who inject drugs, and also uh, HIV-infected men who engage in sex with other men. And then all pregnant women, ideally at uh, the initial visit. Uh, regardless of uh, any symptoms, uh, if there are any risk factors for uh, chronic hepatitis C, um, you should screen uh, because it is uh, uh, still uh, very prevalent. So uh, persons who inject illicit drugs, then you, know, you have uh, people who uh, use steroids, obtain illicitly, or do have tattoos in uh, uh, unregulated settings. Uh, there are, um, there's a laundry list of uh, uh, risk factors for uh, hepatitis C. Um, important to emphasize that the majority of patients with chronic hepatitis C, they are completely asymptomatic. Uh, up to 80% have no symptoms at all. Uh, and some of the symptoms of hepatitis C can be fairly nonspecific, such as fatigue, nausea, poor appetite, uh, or uh, muscle and joint pains. So it's very important to screen regardless of um, uh, the presence uh, of any symptoms. Natural history of um, hepatitis C. So the acute infection is uh, arbitrarily defined as the first six months after a known exposure. Um, of those people exposed, uh, 15 to you know, up to 25 percent uh, will clear the infection, but the vast majority of them will go on to develop chronic hepatitis C. Um, and they may or may not have extra hepatic manifestations, which we will talk about. Uh, within the first 20 years, 10 to 20 percent of those people uh, infected uh, and will develop uh, uh, liver cirrhosis. And of those, up to 30 percent will go on to decompensated liver disease. Uh, 10 years after that. Um, along with that, there's a concomitant risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma, which is um, 1 to 4 percent a year um, after the diagnosis of uh, cirrhosis. Um, and this risk, even after treatment, never completely goes away. It does go down after treatment, but never completely goes away. So it's something to be aware of. Acute hepatitis C, uh, it's typically subclinical, rarely uh, symptomatic or leading to fulminant hepatic failure. Um, new from a recommendation from the uh, hepatitis C guidance panel is a uh, test and treat strategy. So um, for the first time, uh, there is a recommendation to treat uh, patients diagnosed with acute hepatitis C. Uh, previous to that, um, the guidelines were somewhat uh, ambiguous, and uh, there, uh, there was a recommendation, yeah, you could treat, but you could also wait to see if the, uh, the infection would clear spontaneously. So um, now it's less ambiguous, and it's thought to lead to um, less uh, patients lost to follow up over time. 
Um, as far as the treatment, the treatments are the same um, for acute hepatitis C, um, and we'll discuss those uh, um, a few slides uh, down the, the line. Uh, they are safe, they are effective, and they are very well tolerated by the patients. So uh, this slide demonstrates uh, the uh, uh, serology. So uh, the antibodies might not uh, be detectable in the bloodstream for up to uh, three months after acute uh, exposure or infection. Uh, the HCV RNA is typically positive within two weeks of exposure. And as you can see, the ALT typically has a fluctuating course during the, you know, during the disease over the years. Uh, fibrosis, we already discussed this in previous talks, so I'm not going to spend much time here. Um, and again, this is a liver biopsy demonstrating with a trichrome strain, uh, stain, the um, uh, fibrosis and formation of nodules over time leading to cirrhosis. So cirrhosis and portal hypertension uh, leads to several dreaded complications such as hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, um, uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome, uh, variceal hemorrhage, and hepatorenal syndrome. And um, as I mentioned before, hepatocellular carcinoma as well. Um, this um, um, is a, a list of the extrahepatic manifestations of uh, hepatitis C. And what's important to note here is that um, these extrahepatic manifestations can occur at any time during the course of the disease. So you don't need to have cirrhosis to have uh, mixed cryoglobulinemia or porphyria or uh, chronic uh, renal disease. Uh, there is uh, an independent association of um, hep uh, hepatitis C and diabetes uh, mellitus. Uh, there's also uh, vascular complications. Um, arth arthritis and arthralgias associated with uh, chronic hepatitis C, as well as depression. So these can occur at any time during the course of the disease. Um, interestingly, um, hepatitis C therapy has impacted uh, uh, care, and hepatitis C is no longer the leading indication for liver transplant in the United States. So since 2014, uh, it's been surpassed by alcoholic liver disease and uh, 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 methyl. So uh, um, hepatitis C is uh, worldwide is still a leading indication for um, a liver transplant. So let's go over the screening algorithm. So the first test you want to get ideally is a hepatitis C antibody. Uh, and ideally, it should have a reflex to uh, check a hepatitis C RNA. If it's negative, you don't have an infection. You can stop testing. The only possible exceptions are if there is a recent exposure. As I mentioned before, the antibody might be negative. So you might want to recheck in three to six months. Also, some immunosuppressed individuals, they might not uh, develop uh, a hepatitis C antibody. If the um, um, antibody is positive and the RNA is positive as well, you have a diagnosis of chronic hepatitis C and should, uh, you should refer for treatment or, or you know, initiate treatment. If it's negative, again, it's, uh, if you have a positive antibody and a negative PCR, it is recommended that you repeat the test in three to six months. The goals of treatment are, one, to eradicate the hepatitis C infection and all its possible complications. Secondary goals are to improve liver histology and slow progression to end-stage liver disease, including hepatocellular carcinoma. Well, several factors affect uh, uh, treatment, and we will go over those. 
So this is a, a slide with uh, um, historic value and it brings back memories. Uh, I, I was in fellowship when um, pegylate interferon first came out and we thought it was a revolution at that time with 50% uh, sustained viral uh, response and uh, one injection once a week, it seemed to be a, a revolution. Um, but uh, the revolution was yet to come. Uh, and that was around 2011 with uh, the introduction of direct acting antivirals, uh, which, uh, you know, which made possible the use of um, uh, interferon-free um, cure of hepatitis C. And then a second revolution occurred around 2016, 2017 with the introduction of uh, pangenotypic um, uh, DAAs. So uh, the direct antivirals, they um, act at several spots in, in the um, virus life cycle. And um, they uh, basically, uh, there are non-structural proteins and also uh, uh, structural proteins that uh, these drugs um, affect and basically uh, these are some of the drugs that uh, are typically used. You have the protease inhibitors, which are the drugs ending in Previr, the NS non-structural protein 5A inhibitors, which end in Asvir, and then you have the non-structural 5B polymerase inhibitors, which end in Bosvir. So um, these are the drugs as they came out. Uh, and if you... Uh, the, the drugs that we use uh, in the vast majority of patients now are the last two, which is um, uh, sofosbuvir, velpatasvir, and glicopavir and pibrantasvir. Um, there's uh, another medication that's also used, but mostly for uh, DAA failures, uh, which is basically uh, soft bell with the addition of protease inhibitor, but it's beyond the scope of this talk. So some of the adverse events of uh, hepatitis C therapies, interferon, a uh, notoriously poorly tolerated drug, um, caused pancytopenia, depression, rash, GI symptoms. Patients felt miserable on it. And then, you know, ribavirin, also several side effects. Uh, DAAs are very well tolerated. Um, mild fatigue, mild headache, nausea. Some patients have diarrhea, but in general, very well tolerated. You have to be aware of drug-drug interactions, and you should check uh, the um, uh, interactions possible uh, before starting any uh, therapy. I have to hurry because I'm, I'm getting the, the, the signal from, from the back of the room. So um, these are some of the simplified uh, uh, treatment algorithms for treatment-naive patients with, uh, without cirrhosis and chronic hepatitis C. So. Um, you have to uh, screen for uh, fibrosis or uh, cirrhosis. So you can use the non-invasive tests that Dr. Uh, Mohammed mentioned before. Um, and um, uh, you can also use a fiber scan if there is a doubt. Um, you have to do a medication reconciliation. And then you have some, to do some uh, pretreatment uh, lab testing. But uh, if your patients meet this criteria, a soft bell or for 12 weeks or a glipib for eight weeks um, are uh, extremely effective with close to 98-99% uh, uh, rate of uh, um, SVR at 12 weeks. And patients who do not have cirrhosis uh, do not have to have um, follow-up uh, long-term. They do not need to follow up with a gastroenterologist after um, uh, treatment. Uh, they do have to be monitored for uh, if they are on diabetes medications or if they are taking warfarin because with the improvement in liver function, uh, there has to be uh, adjustments in medications afterwards. Patients with um, compensated cirrhosis, treatment naive again, uh, very similar to the previous protocol. Uh, the only difference here is with uh, uh, genotype 3, uh, they have to be tested for um, a, um, a RAS mutation, uh, Y93H. Uh, 
before using SoftBell. They can still get uh, GLEDPIB. And finally, uh, this is pretty much, uh, it's very similar. The only difference here is adding uh, an ultrasound for patients with cirrhosis to um, make sure they don't have hepatocellular carcinoma and also to screen for subclinical ascites. Uh, finally, uh, patients with uh, cirrhosis do need to follow up with a gastroenterologist. Uh, it is a golden rule in gastroenterology that uh, once you have uh, cirrhosis, you need to be uh, followed uh, closely for uh, development of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and also uh, screening for um, uh, esophageal varices to prevent uh, uh, bleeding. So hepatitis C is one of the leading indications for liver transplant. Uh, screening is very important, both universal and risk-based. Um, current recommendations uh, recommend screening for uh, all adults uh, aged 18 and older. Uh, periodic hepatitis C testing for all persons with ongoing risk factors. Uh, curable disease. New oral drugs have uh, excellent response rates and very few adverse events, very well tolerated. So I'd like to welcome back Dr. Muhammad to provide an update on the diagnosis, management, and surveillance of patients with cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Dr. Muhammad. Thank you again, um, Jess, for inviting me again. So wonderful presentation, Dr. Fernandez, and I think uh, the few presentations we have done so far uh, set the stage for this next one, right? So we talked about MAF-LD, right? And then uh, the risk factor for MAF-LD progression to cirrhosis, fibrosis, and then of course, portal hypertension needing a liver transplant. Uh, and some patients who can't get to the transplant is a poor outcome. And of course, hepatitis C um, was the leading one um, indication for transplant a few years ago. Now is uh, alcoholic liver disease, and soon MAF-LD or NASH uh, will uh, surpass that. So this set a stage for the next talk. We're going to talk about uh, diagnosis management, surveillance uh, in patients with portal hypertension and cirrhosis. And this will give way to the next presentation here by Dr. Leone regarding uh, liver transplantation. So let's get started. So again, um, uh, this slide will tell you where the data is coming from. Uh, we are uh, looking at uh, liver AASLD uh, guidelines published in Journal of Hepatology in the last um, less than 10 years. So 2016, we started with portal hypertension risk for bleeding. Then we have uh, ASCITES guideline published in 2021. And the most recent Bovino 7 criteria is published as recent as few weeks ago, a few months ago in 2022, talking about the guidelines, how to monitor these patients uh, with portal hypertension. So again, I love pathophysiology, as you can tell from previous uh, presentations. So again, pathophysiology, because I think this is a key. And unless you know pathophysiology, you're not going to treat these patients because you don't know the mechanism. So it's very important, again. So... We know that if you go to the physiology, right, so the change in the pressure, which is equal to the resistance and the blood flow. So anything which changes the pressure, uh, anything which changes the resistance or the blood flow increases, you have a change in the pressure. We're talking about portal pressure here. So what happens in patients with chronic liver disease, you have change in both of these parameters, right? So you have increased resistance, as mentioned here, and you have increased blood flow which is mentioned here. Why it happened? Because you have mechanical and dynamic dysfunction in the liver. You have decreased architectural, uh, um, architectural changes, increased fibrosis in the liver, and of course you have endothelial dysfunction and increased vascular tone that leads to um, hepatic resistance. At the same time, you have splanchnic vasodilation. So these portal vein and the small vessels, they get dilated because you have increased nitric oxide. So the key 
culprit is nitrous oxide. And of course, you have other, other um, uh, hormones at the, at the molecular level, uh, carbon monoxide, glucagon, um, and hyperkinetic syndrome, all of that causes increased portal flow. So in the patients with liver disease and advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, you have changes in the hepatic architecture and you have changes in the flow and both of these increases the portal pressure in the liver. So by definition, what is the high portal pressure or portal hypertension? It's a gradient, it's called hepatic venous pressure gradient. So when I see FVPG, this stands for hepatic venous pressure gradient, which is synonym to portal hypertension, all right? And we'll talk um, more about it uh, uh, in the upcoming slide. So how do we objectively measure portal hypertension, right? So if a patient comes to you with complications such as ascites, viruses, encephalopathy, they have portal hypertension. We know that very well, right? That's a clinical diagnosis. But what is the objective way of measuring the portal pressure? That's very important. And then these are the two ways where uh, you can accurately and objectively measure and quantify the portal pressure. Uh, how good or bad it is, all right? So, so just do a little uh, anatomy here. So, uh, so you have the hepatic vein over here, you have the portal vein combined from here, SMV and the splenic, and then you have intrahepatics and then hepatic vein goes in there. So, so, if you, so this is done by two different methods, our colleagues with uh, interventional radiology here and advanced endoscopy, they both can help us out in getting these pressures done, right? So when the, when the IR, they do the portal pressure measurement, they put a catheter in the hepatic vein, include the balloon, right there, and then you can get two types of pressure, right? You're gonna get a wedge hepatic pressure, we think balloon is occluded, and you get a free hepatic pressure when the balloon is deflated, and this is how you get a gradient, right? And this gradient will tell you your portal hypertension. So that's one way of doing it, and at the same time, you can do a liver biopsy. Second and more recent technology, which has recently been introduced to advanced endoscopies, is this small catheter device um, mentioned by Cook, and they, um, uh, so basically, this is a very small needle, 25 gauge, and then through the EUS guided, you put a small needle into the portal vein here, and of course, you're gonna put it in the hepatic vein, and you get the pressure readings in there. You can still do the liver biopsy with the same technique. And then you get a portal pressure gradient similar to the hepatic, hepatic venous pressure gradient here. So they both are pretty comparable, right? And, but just different techniques to accurately measure the portal pressure. So what's the severity of the portal hypertension? So as we said, any pressure less than five is normal. If it's six and above, it qualifies for a portal hypertension. If the pressure is more than 10, it's called clinically significant portal hypertension. So I'm gonna use terminology CSPH. Uh, a lot during the uh, presentation, and the CSPH basically stands for clinically significant portal hypertension. However, if the pressure is more than 12, then you are at risk for complications such as varicell bleeding, ascites, encephalopathy, what have you. So, what are the different types of portal hypertension, right? So, um, so in order to understand the types of portal hypertension, you have to know the anatomy a little bit here. So, as I was telling you earlier, so if you start from here, right? So, you have a spleen. So a splenic vein comes out, you have SMV here, and then it combines into the portal vein, goes into the liver right and left, and then drains the blood out into the hepatic vein, goes to the IVC, goes to the heart. So this is the normal physiology of the venous flow in the liver. Um, and now, if you, when you know this thing, you're gonna know exactly where the pressure is coming from because not all portal hypertension is coming from the liver. You have to know this, right? So when you have a patient with ascites, uh, varices, you have to know where the majority of this patient, of course, will have liver disease cirrhosis, but some of these patients, will, the pressure may be coming from a different reason. So, so let's discuss this very briefly. So we, we have five different uh, types of portal hypertension. We're gonna start from top down. So the number one is coming from above, right? It's called post-hepatic portal hypertension. So either you have a congestive heart failure or you have butt chiari, which is occlusion of, uh, of the hepatic vein causing high pressure. Second one is intrahepatic post-sinusoidal. So these are the, uh, and it's a very rare condition, very rarely, unless you are doing transplants, you're not gonna see venoclusive disease or sinusoidal obstructive syndrome, very rare, but it can happen. And the most common one, as I was telling you here, is this one, which is sinusoidal, cirrhosis, polycystic liver disease, NRH, and metastatic disease. Then you go to intrahepatic pre-sinusoidal here, 
less common, some of the drugs can cause that. And of course, prehepatic is another common one, means the most common one is portal vein thrombosis. So all of these things can cause portal hypertension. Of course, sinusoidal is the most common, uh, and this is the topic uh, of the day with cirrhosis and portal hypertension. So how do you diagnose where the pressure is coming from again? Uh, of course, clinical workup, patient physical examination will give you the hint. But if you have to diagnose accurately again, you have to go to the basic science, which is hepatic venous pressure gradient management, and which can be done through the uh, catheter into the hepatic vein, and also measure the pressure of our intervention radiologist colleague do that. So, and this is a very useful slide. I use it, I teach it to the students, residents, fellows, all of them, because this is very handy, because you don't know where the ascites is coming coming from, right? So this is going to explain you where it's coming from. So as I told you earlier in the previous slide, you have uh, prehepatic, you have pre-sinusoidal, sinusoidal, you have SOS, but carry, and you have heart failure. So what happens in the prehepatic type, all the pressures are normal, if you look into it there, all right? So if you have portal vein thrombosis, all the pressures are normal, but they still have ascites, all right? If you have sinusoidal, which is the most common thing, cirrhosis, then of course your wedge pressure is high, however, your free is normal, but the gradient, which is HVPG, is higher in this setting. And then the post-hepatic, which is a very common we see in our practice here, which is right heart failure patients, and they have ascites, you don't know where it's coming from. Of course, you do the pressure measurements, you do the biopsy, and what happens here, you have the both of these pressures are high, which is a wedge and a free, however, the gradient is normal. So this is a very handy tool. Of course, it requires an intervention and pressure monitoring, but you can accurately diagnose where the pressure is coming from. Now, so let's talk about cirrhosis and the complication because that's the most important thing why we are discussing this here. The, the dreadful complications for cirrhosis, portal hypertension, of course, is mentioned here, which is variceal bleeding, encephalopathy, ascites, uh, and jaundice. So this is the most important thing. And once they are going from a compensated liver disease to a decompensated, they are at risk for death. And, the, and, and, and this mortality is very high in these patients. Uh, and of course, the life-saving procedure is liver transplantation. So, again, what happened uh, to, at the molecular level for this patient, so once they get cirrhosis, we have discussed this a little bit before, so portal hypertension. So these patients will have a splenic vasodilation, if you remember the first slide. Next happens, you have arterial underfilling, you have activation of renin, angiotensin, and, um, and ADH activation. So what happens, you have vasoconstrictors in the body, right? Renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone, you have more sodium retention, you have, a, and when the sodium is retention is increased, you have increased plasma volume, and of course, you have ascites formation. The other factor which happens in this patient, you have increased antidiuretic hormone, increased ADH receptor, just like SIDH, and then increased uh, water retention, and of course, you have dilutional hyponatremia. Then the vasoconstrictant also uh, affects on the renal vasculature. You have renal hypoperfusion. That leads to renal failure and hepatorenal syndrome. And of course, more, very important thing here is bacterial translocation. These patients can have bacterial translocation, which leads to spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, very high risk for mortality. How do you diagnose, uh, uh, again, uh, on the ascites fluid? and see what is causing the high pressure. Uh, this is acidic fluid analysis. Very handy, use it all the time. Anyone who presents to your, uh, in your liver unit or in the medical unit with ascites, when you do a therapeutic and diagnostic paracentesis, always check for SAG. So SAG stands for serum acetic albumin gradient. Very simple to use. You just get the serum albumin level, subtract the acetic fluid albumin, and it will give you a number. So if the SAG is more than 1.1, it suggests portal hypertension coming from either cirrhosis or post-sinusoidal. Then you check for the acetic fluid total protein level. So if the total protein is less than 2.5, you have cirrhosis because you have synthetic dysfunction in the liver, and then you can identify cirrhosis through imaging. But if the total protein is high, then you're dealing with something else, such as but carry your right heart failure because the liver is fine in there. And you can do different testing to find out. Now, on the other side, if you have a SAG, which is less than 1.5, it's not coming from the liver, it's not coming from the heart, it's not coming from but carry, 
then uh, there is uh, there's a missing tab here, um, but if you look into the same algorithm, follow it here, you have acidic fluid total protein less than 2.5 here, you have nephrotic syndrome, okay? So you can identify because this patient can also have ascites, but if you have total protein more than 2.5 in this algorithm right there, you have any of these diseases. You have sarcoidosis, TB peritonitis, uncommon things, but that can happen. And of course, you can do uh, some blood work and a diagnostic laparoscopy with peritoneal biopsy. Moving on. So we talked about the complication including ascites and renal failure. Hepatorenal syndrome is one of the serious complications because if the patient is into hepatorenal type 1, type 2, depending on where they are, it can lead to chronic kidney disease, hemodialysis, very high mortality, and of course, uh, liver transplant is life-saving uh, in this one. So how to manage and diagnose this patient? You have to rule out. If they present to you with acute kidney injury and rising creatinine, you have to do your workup, get nephrology involved, do some testing in the urine, blood, and find, rule out ATN and other causes, secondary causes of renal failure. But if they are all out and your diagnosis is clear with hepatorenal syndrome, first and most important thing is withdraw all the diuretics, okay? Withdraw all the diuretics and give them plasma volume expander. Give them fluids, give them albumin, and, and wait for 48 hours, see if there's resolution. Most of the patients will recover after this. But if they don't, then the next step is to go into the vasopressors. Uh, we use octreotide here, uh, and then of course, terlipressin is not approved by FDA, but used exclusively in Europe. And then the next thing, if nothing will work after the vasopressors, so constrictive therapy, then the next step is hemodialysis or CVVHD. So, so as we just talked about, the complication of portal hypertension that include ascites, hyponatremia, and of course, hepatorenal syndrome, which carries a poor prognosis right here. Why we are saying this poor prognosis? Because these are the markers which have been used in all different prognostication modules. So if you start, if you remember the child scoring system which we started using for last 20 years, it was initially proposed for TIPS and then transplant, which is recently replaced by MELD scoring system. So encephalopathy and the ascites are the two portal hypertension measures that are included in the child scoring system. Bilirubin, INR, and albumin is the synthetic function of the liver. And uh, on the MELT side also, if you have uh, blue ribbon, INR, and creatinine, creatinine is included in there because again, hepatorenal syndrome has high mortality in these patients. And if you look into this thing, these are acute uh, on chronic liver failure patients. The patients with hyponatremia has the worst prognosis arm out of all of those things, which led to an amendment in the MELD scoring system, and now we are using MELD sodium. So apart from uh, bilirubin, INR, and creatinine, we are using sodium with hyponatremia as a poor prognostic indicator, including the MELD uh, system with the MELD sodium. Management of ascites. So the management of ascites depends where the problem is coming from. And these are the different targets you can use in the management of, uh, of ascites. And let's go over this, okay? So cirrhosis, again, there is no treatment of cirrhosis except liver transplantation. Next, if you have portal hypertension, of course, transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt tips. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, then you can use vasoconstrictor, as I told you earlier, plasma expanders. Then diuretics loop and the spinolactone come into the picture that affects into this pathway. Um, and then uh, large volume paracentesis, chips. Uh, so these are the different mechanism targets to treat these patients. And, if, and this is also important, uh, V2 receptor antagonist. So this has been FDA approved now in patients with hyponatremia. So if you have severe hyponatremia, not getting better with volume restriction, we can use SAMSCA tolvaptan, which is a V2 receptor antagonist that works on the antidiuretic hormone and, uh, you, and helps you in management of hyponatremia. There are certain complications. It cannot be used outpatient. It's only purely inpatient management but we use exclusively in our patient, especially if they are going for liver transplant. Next, dreadful, complica dreadful complication is variceal bleeding, uh, secondary to portal hypertension. And this chart basically tells you about an algorithm, what to do with these patients. So if these patients, uh, they have portal hypertension, we know that they get, uh, sorry, they get uh, perform a screening endoscopy 
based on the endoscopy, you can decide uh, when is the next endoscopy is ne needed. So you can take pictures of this one. This is uh, out of this journal, which is currently used as a guideline. But the most important thing is that these patients, if they are high risk patient, they have high um, um, LSM fibrosis score, they are cirrhotic, you have to screen them for varices. And based on what you find here, you can, you can change your surveillance endoscopy three years, two years, one year, and but the most important thing as per the guidelines is that once you put them a non-selective beta blocker, we'll talk about it, and also you can do the banding, there is no need to further survey unless they have changed in their liver dynamics. How do you manage varices and variceal bleeding? There are a few things we can do in these patients. And again, this will tell you at the pathway level where the problem is and how do we fix it. So if you have, remember at the first slide, increase hepatic resistance and increase portal flow. That these two contribute portal hypertension. So the drugs or the treatment things are acting on this one. So if you are an increased hepatic resistance, of course, you have carvedilol and TIPS, the transjugular intrahepatic uh, portosystemic shunt. We will have uh, two slides on this next. Uh, but you can use non-selective, uh, uh, sorry, you can use non-selective beta blockers. Somatostatin analogs we use exclusively in US, which is octreotide, which works on splanchnic vasodilation. And then vasopressors, such as um, uh, terlipressin, which is not FDA approved, but exclusively used in Europe. Uh, here we use medotrain instead uh, as an analog. Um, Non-selective beta blocker also are helpful in decreasing portal pressure here uh, and increasing the card and uh, work on the cardiac output. Two slides on uh, uh, TIPS. So transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt is a valid uh, uh, modality in tackling these patients with portal hypertension. The, our radiologist intervention um, uh, colleagues do this procedure, and you put a catheter into the hepatic vein, and you put a small shunt in there, bypassing the hepatic parenchyma. So this is a shunt between the hepatic vein and the portal vein. So this alleviates your portal hypertension. It can be used uh, in patients with severe disease. There are certain indications out there. The most common ones we use nowadays is, of course, uh, variceal bleeding and refractory ascites, but there are other indications such as GAVE, such as uh, portal gastropathy, uh, butt carry, hepatopulmonary syndrome, um, um, venoclusive disease where tips can be useful and used. But very important thing, this is very important. So th we have to know where not to use tips, not to send our patients because there are contraindications and actually putting a shunt can also uh, uh, cause patients with severe side effects and liver failure and death. So um, not as a primary not as a primary prevention of variceal bleeding. So patients who never bled, you cannot do a TIPS on these patients. You have to go with bending and, and non-selective beta blockers. Congestive heart failure is another one of them because what's happening, you're bypassing all the flow directly from the liver out and going into the heart. So if they are in heart failure, their heart failure is going to get worse. So pre-TIPS, we always get echocardiogram in these patients, look for EF, look for pulmonary artery pressure, and also we also get uh, the uh, four-phase CT scan of the liver, looking for anatomy. And there are certain other relative contraindications mentioned there. Moving on. So what is the role of TIPS in ascites? And the next slide will be on the variceal bleeding. So TIPS definitely has a role in management of refractory ascites, okay? So you have to know the definition of refractory ascites, which means you have done everything. They are on maximum dose of diuretics, salt restriction, but they are filling up every week. They are coming to you every week. You're giving them albumin, and they're coming for 10 liters, 20 liters, 15 liters of fluid drainage every week, and they have done everything medically. TIPS definitely is indicated in these patients. The next role of the TIPS is variceal bleeding, and we have seen these patients out there that present to you with severe variceal bleeding, either is GOV uh, varices, esophageal varices, um, gastric varices, or even rectal varices. They can come with the bleed in portal hypertension. So you can use TIPS as a salvage therapy, and there's a new entity, it's called preemptive TIPS, pre-TIPS. 
PTIPs. So, uh, and this has been using and, and now considered in the guidelines because these are the patients, if they are bleeding, you then endoscopy, you can band it, but these are sick patients, their child is cirrhotic, they are decompensated. So rather than waiting till the end, to put them tips in there, you can preemptive do send them patients for the tips. Uh, but the only caveat right here, uh, there's an asterisk here. The only caveat: these are high male patients, so they are very high risk for decompensation after the tips, such as liver failure, encephalopathy. So I encourage these patients to go for liver transplant evaluation, get them on the list, and then go ahead do the tips. So if they decompensate, at least you have a way out. And then I'm going to finish with a few other slides. Um, portal vein thrombosis, if you look into my, uh, the, the few slides uh, before, is one of the other indication, uh, one other reason for portal hypertension. There are three types of portal vein thrombosis. We see this very commonly in our practice here, acute, chronic, and tumor-related. The most important thing you have to remember is that if you have acute thrombus and they're symptomatic with abdominal pain, you have to anticoagulate these patients. Uh, the chronic one, uh, uh, if they are chronic portal vein thrombus, but they have recanalization of the portal vein already in patients with cirrhosis, half of them will recanalize. Leave them alone. Uh, they don't need to be anticoagulated. And the third one, and the, which is the most serious one, is the tumor thrombus, because sometimes you have uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, class skin tumor, all of this uh, invading into the portal vein, and that's really a bad situation for the patient. This guideline will tell you how to manage these patients. Uh, if they have chronic portal vein thrombosis, as I told you earlier, and then they have recanalization, you leave them alone. There is no need for anticoagulation or anything. However, if they are more than 50% occlusion of the portal vein and they are going extending into the splenic and, and SMV, and these patients are candidate for transplant down the road, you have to anticoagulate with low molecular weight heparin, uh, vitamin K antagonist, or the direct acting uh, oral anticoagulants. How long you anticoagulate them? Three to six months. And if there's regression, good, everybody's happy. If not, then again, comes to the tips. And then you can bypass the clotted portal vein. Uh, we'll finish with, I think, two or three more slides. Um, as I told you in my previous lecture with fatty liver um, MAFLD, so we, there's a lot of uh, talk in non-invasive assessment uh, in, in portal hypertension, just like fatty liver also. So FibroScan is uh, the machine which we discussed a little bit before, now which can be used in identifying portal hypertension in this patient without doing any of the invasive things we talked about. Again, those the procedures and, and the needles and everything are good, and sometimes you need to do this to accurately identify, but you can start with a non-invasive modality to assess for portal hypertension. Fibroscan is one of them, and this is coming out from the Bavino 6 uh, group uh, in the paper I mentioned on the first slide. So let's just go over this very quickly. If you have, so um, if you remember, so when you do a fibroscan, you get two different types of readings. So you talk about steatosis and fibrosis. So the fibrosis is measured into kilo, kilopascals, KPA. So if you have a KPA score which is very low, less than five, you have normal, and you don't have advanced chronic liver disease. Um, but if the, your, the scores are going up there all the way here, you are getting more and more advanced chronic liver disease into a portal hypertension, and a score more than 25 suggests you have clinically significant portal hypertension. The important thing over here from Bovino 6 is that if their score is less than 20 right there, and the platelets more than 150, they're usually well compensated. Then they say they don't need to do endoscopy for very serious screening because likelihood of having a varicis is almost null. So this is another, you know, we as a gastroenterologist love our endoscopies uh, scopes. Um, but, you know, this is another tool um, in your box to, um, so that you can take care of this patient and you can take care of them if you don't want invasive procedures to be done. Last slide, so take home points. So clinically significant portal hypertension uh, is a major consequence of cirrhosis, uh, including uh, refractory ascites, variceal bleeding, encephalopathy, invasive and non-invasive diagnostic modalities are available in the management of these patients. HVPG pressure is accurately, yeah, you can identify where the pressure is coming from. 
Management includes um, of ascites, diuretics, large volume paracentesis, albumin infusion, and, and tips. Management of variceal bleeding include uh, non-selective beta blockers, variceal bending, tips, and BRTO, uh, which our radiology colleagues uh, intervention also do it, which is a balloon retrograde transvenous obliteration of varices, invasive procedure, but sometimes you have to do it if tips is not amenable. Hyponatremia, hepatorenal syndrome, uh, is a poor prognostic sign. Liver transplant, which Dr. Leone is gonna talk about next, uh, is the life-saving procedure if they get uh, uh, clinically significant portal hypertension in the advanced chronic liver disease. Now the last two things are uh, purely investigational, but I think it's important to talk about it, what the future looks like. So there has been a lot of research into anti direct antifibrotic uh, agent. FXR agonist uh, is one of them, uh, which we talked about a little bit in the MAF-LD, um, uh, obeticolic acid, and, and renin angiotensin system, and, of, and angiogenesis. So these are the target where the new molecules are being researched to uh, target and treat the underlying factor of portal hypertension. Gut microbiota coming again. As I told you, every disease, gut microbiota is the key factor. So uh, gut microbiota is altered in this patient with clinically significant portal hypertension. So uh, fecal microbiota transplantation can change the dynamics of gut microbiota and can be used as a treatment for portal hypertension, hepatic encephalopathy. But again, remember, these two, not FDA approved, is still investigational. And I think with that, this is the last slide. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd like to next introduce Dr. John Leone. He's gonna be our last speaker for this session. Dr. Leone is a board-certified general surgeon who's been providing surgical care in Tampa Bay since 2001. Dr. Leone has been recognized as a devoted and attentive surgeon in the areas of general surgery, including transplant surgery and complex hernia repair. He specializes in end-stage renal disease, providing comprehensive surgical care for dialysis access and hyperparathyroidism. Please help me welcome him to the podium to discuss the role of transplantation for patients with non-alcoholic and alcoholic liver cirrhosis. Dr. Leone. All right, thank you very much. I'm honored to uh, talk to you today uh, about the role of uh, transplantation in the liver failure patients. And uh, the uh, talks that were just given uh, were uh, great segues for me. Uh, if my services could be avoided for the patient, that's the best case scenario. Um, as the uh, liver cirrhosis uh, progresses, you have the inflammatory process uh, that essentially clogs the filter, as uh, Dr. Muhammad was saying, and uh, eventually you have uh, a destruction of the liver where it takes about three quarters of the liver to be destroyed uh, before you get into trouble and needing a, a liver transplant. And that's just uh, uh, kind of a, a across the board. If you look at all end-stage uh, organ diseases that can be treated by transplant, it's below 20% that you begin to see a uh, function where the body or that organ cannot handle the daily metabolic needs of, of the body. So that really, if you look at all the systems across the board, 80% uh, is reserved for demand uh, uh, beyond uh, what you would need for just your uh, daily living. Uh, what does this really mean uh, for the patient? Uh, uh, so then as the uh, liver progresses into the cirrhotic stage, uh, you have the increase in uh, portal hypertension uh, that Dr. Mohammed just went through. And as you can see, that's going to be on your final exam uh, at the end of the course, okay? Uh, the consequences that Dr. Muhammad just went through are the uh, CITES, Anasarca, GI bleed, and hepatorenal uh, uh, syndrome, uh, conservative management while uh, the patients are uh, on the waiting list uh, is the best choice. Uh, but as he indicated, uh, if we need to uh, move forward uh, with a TIPS procedure, uh, to decompress the uh, portal system. That's the uh, primary role now. 
uh, open surgical procedures have essentially gone uh, by the wayside. Uh, I'm not aware of a patient that uh, was not able to undergo a TIPS that then re uh, acquired a, a last resort of an open uh, surgical procedure. Uh, as uh, Dr. Mohammed alluded to, uh, the main system for uh, monitoring and categorizing the patients uh, for a liver transplant uh, is uh, using uh, the MELD score uh, uh, that's been devised. And it really gives us an excellent uh, indication of what 90-day survival would be like uh, with patients with advanced liver disease. The indicated INR, bilirubin, creatinine are the main factors in the uh, 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 formula. And then most recently, the addition of sodium, where hyponatremia uh, is an uh, indicator of worsening disease and very poor uh, prognosis. Uh, when looking at the MELD score, how they uh, play out, uh, typically the score will be between 60 and 40, uh, with 6 being the best likelihood of survival. You're not eligible to be even listed for a transplant unless you have a MELD score of 12. And then once you're on the list, uh, typically you're not even eligible to be transplanted until you have a score that's greater than 15. Uh, right now, most centers are uh, transplanting uh, with scores well into, into the 20s, uh, even though you may be listed with a score of 15. From a liver transplant team standpoint, how we're able to uh, use the MELD score, as I said, when you have a score of 12 to 15, you'll be on the list, but most of these patients are doing just fine. They're still actively working. They're um, uh, managed medically, and uh, really it, it'll be a while before they would be considered uh, uh, eligible to receive a transplant. When patients have a score between 15 and 20, these are ones that are still at home working, uh, but then all of a sudden they'll have a hiccup, either a GI bleed, uh, they're having uh, very big problems with ascites or uh, encephalopathy uh, is not being able to manage. They'll come into the hospital, uh, they'll be tuned up, uh, what we would call uh, in our, our team, and uh, be in the hospital maybe two to three days, maybe up to a week, uh, get uh, uh, the decompensated aspect of the disease corrected, and then they'll go home and usually it'll be another uh, three to six months before, let's say, they would have another episode uh, if they weren't uh, transplanted in the interim. When patients have a MELD score greater than 20, uh, these are individuals that uh, will need to be uh, hospitalized many times for a prolonged period of time uh, before they're able to be discharged, and many of them would then be uh, uh, not discharged and stay in the hospital until they're transplanted. If you have a score uh, greater than 30, in most instances, these are patients that are uh, in the intensive care unit, and if we're not able to get a liver for them soon, they, they won't be leaving the uh, hospital alive. It's rare instance that somebody is um, at home uh, with a score that's uh, greater than 30. Uh, looking at eligibility for transplantations, uh, most uh, liver failure patients with cirrhosis are, are eligible, uh, and you'll see that over the past uh, uh, decade plus, uh, the uh, eligibility criteria has changed quite, quite a bit, so I'm going to want to spend a little time on that now. Uh, strict contraindications for uh, transplant are uncorrectable coronary artery disease, and uh, really more importantly, are pulmonary, uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension uh, that's not able to be corrected with the uh, agents that are available. In patients with severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, they may have to be hospitalized on a drip uh, in order for us to uh, properly manage that. If we can't get the uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, corrected, uh, they won't be a candidate because they won't survive the surgery. <clears throat> Uh, medical non-adherence or a history of it uh, is uh, a contraindication, and until they uh, provide uh, documentation of adherence, uh, they uh, will not be able to be listed. Lack of social support. It's a very rigorous process going through the transplant, 
pre, during, and post, and unless they have adequate support for transportation, assistance with medication, assistance at home, uh, it, it's a, a setup for failure if they don't have proper support, and the same thing without uh, proper financial means. However, these are uh, areas, uh, social areas, that can be uh, uh, corrected, they can be assisted uh, through the programs. Most transplant, or oh, I shouldn't say most, transplant centers are required to have uh, adequate uh, 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 social work uh, services uh, and financial services to assist the patients in being able to uh, uh, meet these means uh, if they don't uh, have it at, at home uh, prior to uh, coming in for evaluation. Uncontrolled mental health issues are uh, also a contraindication. Uh, however, uh, patients, uh, let's say, with bipolar disease that are fully controlled uh, can be considered uh, for transplantation. On the next slide, uh, these are changes that took place uh, within the last 10 to 15 years where they were previous absolute contraindications and now relative uh, contraindications. Uh, obesity uh, being one of them. We've heard about a lot about obesity today. Uh, prior uh, to that, uh, patients were required to lose weight or get uh, uh, into some sort of program that would put them on a proper course, uh, but now many centers are even considering transplanting patients with BMIs greater than 40. Uh, drug abuse used to be uh, a strict contraindication. Uh, marijuana use, and especially now with uh, medical marijuana and CBD uh, products, that uh, marijuana is no longer a uh, strict contraindication. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, alcohol abuse is no longer a contraindication. Uh, and uh, what's changed there is even acute alcoholic uh, hepatitis hepatitis and failure, uh, those patients will be considered for an urgent transplant. And what has been uh, demonstrated over the last uh, 20 years or so uh, through the social uh, and mental health literature related to uh, liver transplantation is that recidivism is very high uh, with respect to patients who had liver transplants for alcoholic uh, disease. Uh, most centers over the uh, uh, 1980s and 90s into the 2000s had strict criteria of patients needing to go through either AA and show demonstration of uh, at least six months of sobriety uh, with respect to uh, their alcohol disease. The literature is now demonstrating that most of those patients have returned to drinking alcohol, but not necessarily being uh, strict alcoholics. So that to uh, and to then lose the liver to uh, repeat uh, alcoholic disease. So because of those findings, it was felt unfair to that patient population for alcoholic disease uh, to exclude them uh, by strict criteria as once was once held. And then uh, active hepatitis C, now as you saw with our uh, presentation of today, uh, these agents have essentially eliminated uh, hepatitis C uh, from uh, the picture uh, as the main uh, reason for liver transplantation. And now obesity and fatty uh, liver disease is the main uh, indicator for transplantation. Cancer. Uh, across the board is uh, considered a uh, contraindication for solid organ transplantation until the patients are demonstrated to be disease-free. Interestingly enough, though, the exception for that is HCC. Uh, you'll see later on in the uh, presentations today where uh, cirrhosis, no matter what the leading cause of the cirrhosis was, but once the patient gets to that state, uh, they're at a very high risk for developing uh, HCC and uh, liver tumors. And in that scenario, transplantation will be the cure uh, for those patients. Uh, you have to have no vascular involvement, no extrahepatic metastasis, and no lymphatic involvement or uh, 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 distant uh, metastasis. And the first one I meant local uh, extrahepatic metastasis. Um, 
interventional radiology uh, is very helpful. You'll hear talks about this later uh, with bridging therapies, which are either radiofrequency or cryoablation, and uh, TACE or transhepatic arterial chemoembolization uh, may be helpful in bridging that patient uh, to uh, uh, transplant and then uh, successfully undergoing the procedure and being disease free. Uh, the operative procedure itself is rather intensive. Uh, there's a lot of personnel in, in, the, in the room, uh, many, uh, you know, team of anesthesiologists, including the perfusionist, usually requires a minimum of uh, two uh, surgeons, uh, uh, scrub tech circulators, and in patients with hepatorenal syndrome may require intraoperative dialysis. Uh, I could tell you that uh, about 10 years ago, I had the opportunity, and it was uh, uh, one of which uh, a rare opportunity that I feel that I was blessed to participate in for this partic uh, particular patient, uh, where we did a combined uh, liver, pancreas, and uh, renal transplant uh, all at the same time. And in that particular patient, after all was said and done and things went well, we looked back and that individual was under the care of 75 different clinical people during his 10-day hospitalization, not including like other uh, ancillary services like blood draw teams and respiratory therapy or whatever. So it's a rather intensive, uh, labor-intensive and resource-intensive uh, process, uh, but uh, when successful, very well worth it. Uh, this is uh, just... Uh, uh, showing the cirrhotic liver that was uh, uh, taken out. This is the uh, new liver waiting to go uh, in uh, that was prepared on the back table. So we set up a back table in the operating room where the liver is being prepared while the other rest of the team uh, is in the process of removing the liver. <clears throat> the operative approach is, uh, approach is typically through what we call a Mercedes incision. Uh, just like the emblem that you see on the cars, uh, where uh, it's a, a large incision that gives us enough room to visualize everything that needs to be seen. I uh, just want to spend a little bit of time on, on this, so as you become more in, uh, involved with patients over a course of time that have undergone liver transplant or talking to transplant teams, uh, there's just a myriad of uh, approaches that we're, we take because we basically have to take, uh, as, as I say, it, we're putting Ford parts into Chevys, okay? So you have to be rather creative in where you can go with uh, uh, the arterial and vascular supply of, of what we do. So there's uh, the venal veno bi or bicaval uh, in implantation, where you attach the vena cava above and below the liver, just like you naturally would or uh, what we call piggyback, where you'll staple off the uh, bottom part of the vena cava on the liver and then just plug it in uh, end to side using the cava into the, uh, or using the cava of the liver into the cava of the uh, donor recipient that was left completely intact. Uh, portal vein typically uh, were, uh, do just an end to end anastomosis uh, from the native portal vein to uh, the um, liver uh, uh, graft, but we may have to use a, a bridge graft from the donor uh, to get to the superior mesenteric vein uh, because the uh, portal vein is completely occluded by thrombus uh, uh, from chronic disease. Uh, the hepatic artery, we typically will just go end to end from the native hepatic artery. However, sometimes that artery is very friable. It'll fall apart as we're taking out the uh, cirrhotic liver or the caliber is way too small to accommodate the blood flow to the new liver. And we'll have to use a, a donor artery uh, from uh, the uh, donor and it, find an artery that we could bridge it to, either the aorta or down into the iliacs uh, if necessary. Uh, Typically, the bile duct is done end-to-end, -end, but once again, we may have to be creative and bring over a different loop of bowel uh, to attach it to or do it, uh, a new anastomosis directly to the side of the duodenum. Typically, uh, the surgery will take anywhere around four, maybe four and a half to five hours. 
Sometimes you get lucky, it goes earlier, and sometimes it could be up to 10 to 12 hours, depending on the uh, patient scenario. Uh, potential complications, everything you can think of can potentially go wrong. So I'm not going to go through the uh, list individually. Uh, but monitoring of the patient uh, post-transplant, uh, we uh, typically will follow labs, uh, the typical uh, LFTs, AST, ALT, uh, bilirubin. And then uh, if those are uh, looking abnormal, we'll get a duplex ultrasound of the liver to make sure that the portal vein patency is intact, the hepatic artery patency is intact, and the common bile duct. Luckily, nowadays, we do, if there is a problem with one of those uh, uh, entities, uh, either through interventional radiology or uh, ERCP, we're able to uh, correct those uh, uh, strictures, usually is what the problem uh, is. And then if there, all those uh, uh, structures seem to be uh, anatomically intact, uh, then we'll do a percutaneous biopsy to look at rejection. Uh, the uh, types of rejection are hyperacute, which can occur with preformed antibodies immediately. Uh, that's typical for all organ transplant, but the liver is somewhat resistant to that because of the Kufr cells within the liver, the uh, liver is able to filter out. So we don't have to have perfect match of donor and recipient in the liver scenario. Also, uh, I just wanted to mention too, that with the liver transplant. You have a scenario that you really don't have with other organs where we have what's called primary non-function and that we put the organ in, all the connections are intact, and then the uh, liver will begin to fail, okay? And basically that's a function that the liver did not do well with the process of coming out of a, a donor, being on ice for a while, and then being reperfused re into the recipient. Accelerated uh, uh, rejection could occur in scenarios where the patient uh, has persistence of these antibodies that the uh, liver is not able to uh, clear, and that can be uh, taken care of by uh, plasma phoresis and eventually resolve. The main uh, type of uh, rejection that occurs is acute. That's the cellular rejection that you hear most about, usually T cell mediated and there's plenty of agents available now to uh, completely reverse that. Chronic rejection is one that takes place over a long period of time uh, where the patient may be uh, doing well and all your lab work is good, but unfortunately your immunosuppression may be just under, under uh, doing what it needs to uh, uh, do to completely eliminate rejection, and that is something that we see uh, rarely, but it can occur, and uh, biopsy will usually pick that up. The challenges for the future uh, in liver transplantation uh, are, uh, I think, multitude in that uh, we have an aging population. We have one that's getting more and more obese that's been pointed out already, and our uh, patients are getting sicker and sicker. Uh, so that uh, with that, we're, we're still uh, continuing to transplant patients. Uh, patients for liver transplant are eligible uh, uh, even up to age 75, 80 now. Uh, the uh, way that we've expanded our uh, uh, criteria for the organs that we'll use for uh, transplant uh, used to be age 65 would have been a cutoff. Now we're considering organs that are well into their uh, 70s. So um, that definitely influences the uh, recipient population. There's a lot of regulatory issues going on right now as far as organ allocation, uh, especially with respect to liver, where livers are being uh, 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 recovered here, especially in the state of Florida where we have four great OPOs that have always been uh, one of the tops in the nation uh, with respect to Oregon recovery. And now the state of Florida is uh, being more or less forced uh, to share those organs across the country as opposed to being able to use them uh, directly for uh, Floridians. Uh, the fiscal obligations have gotten more and more challenging as well uh, for the patients. Uh, the clinical advances that have taken place 
uh, our technical and medical capabilities, especially with respect to how hepatitis C medications have influenced the uh, patient uh, eligibility and population. And then most recently, I think we've heard in the news about uh, the uh, kidney transplant that was done in genetically modified pigs uh, that was successful and, you know, as you can imagine, down the pipeline uh, would be other solid organs, including uh, liver transplantation. So with that, I think I will conclude and uh, join the panel for any additional questions. Thank you very much. So to kick off our third session of this morning, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Harris. Dr. Harris is a double board certified gastroenterologist at Advent Health Tampa who practices both general gastroenterology and advanced endoscopy. Today he will be discussing the utilization of advanced endoscopic modalities for the diagnosis and management of patients with a Kalaskin tumor. Dr. Harris. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate uh, Ishwanto and Adnan for putting on this uh, nice liver symposium. It's nice to be here, uh, you know, uh, be a part of this, and I congratulate them both for putting this on. I think it's all the talks have been spot on so far. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do, uh, talk a little bit about cholangiocarcinoma, specifically uh, Klatskins. That's what I was uh, tasked to talk, uh, talk about. We'll go over some of the basic epidemiology symptoms and presentation, and really want to concentrate on the role of endoscopy. What is a, what is a, uh, a gastroenterologist, what's, what's my role in, in these patients? And talk about uh, diagnosis, uh, drainage, uh, and possibly even treatment. I'm using a case-based uh, approach to this uh, to make it a little bit more interesting, hopefully. So what are we talking about here? Um, and uh, so, you know, Klatskin's tumors are defined by, um, you know, neoplasm of the bile duct, usually proximal to the cystic duct takeoff and extend up to the hilum here. So uh, this was a patient we had just last month here, a uh, 77-year-old gentleman transferred from an outside hospital, he was really healthy, um, presented with painless jaundice, pruritus, and some weight loss. You can see his labs, his bilirubin was seven, so pretty classic presentation. This could be uh, some sort of uh, neoplasm, pancreas, biliary, and um, so I'm going to channel my radiologist here, uh, self, and uh, go through some films. And you can see this was his CT. And um, you can see here he's got a little dilated duct here on the left side. And I didn't include his whole CT because his pancreas was normal. But as we go down here, um, you can see right here where the arrow is pointing, there's a little enhancement uh, right here on this dot. And that's actually the probably right where the tumor is, where the transition is. And you can actually um, you know, trace this down further, and you can see his bile duct um, decompresses uh, after that, you know, right here. The other interesting thing about this CT, um, back a few here. Um, sorry, a second here. Yeah, there we go. You can see he's got this wedge-shaped area out here in the right liver. And I suspect this may be from um, his, the right portal vein. You can see here that the left portal vein is intact. But as we come down here, you don't, you're don't missing the right portal vein. So I think that was probably some perfusion-related abnormality, but still interesting and pertinent to this case, which we'll get to later. So, um, you know, in an MRCP, um, and again, so, you know, extrapatic bile ducts normal, and you can see uh, there's a transition right up here. You can see it's got dilation of the left system and the right system, but what's really interesting is what you don't see, and this is probably all tumor in here extending up into his right liver. Uh, and again, this is important in terms of uh, how, you know, we manage this. So a little bit of a cholangiocarcinoma, so 3% of GI tumors. Um, I was actually surprised when I was re uh, reviewing the literature for this, but the five-year survival rate's less than 10%. That's pretty dismal and I'd say comparable to pancreas as well. 
in five year survival rate even for um, sorry five year survival rate even for patients that undergo radical uh, resection still only one in three so pretty 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 bad prognosis here. Um, how we classify these patients, um, typically intrahepatic and extrahepatic. And the extrahepatic ones um, can be distal cholangiocarcinomas. Those are typically easier to treat, easier to drain. Um, or the more difficult, but the more common one is the classic and also known as perihilar cholangiocarcinomas. So classification, so uh, this is the bismuth classification here. So bismuth 1, 2 extends up to the confluence, 3A into the right, 3B into the left. Four extensions to both right and the left, and these are these are ones that we're going to focus on really here today, and how we how we manage the how, you know the role of endoscopy. So the presentations very overlaps with other types of neoplasms, particularly pancreatic neoplasms, jaundice, pruritus, anorexia, weight loss. And in terms of diagnosis, how do we do this? We just showed, you know, went over CT and MRI with the, with the case that we presented. There's also a role for endoscopy, which we're going to focus on pretty much throughout the remainder of this talk. But on to CT. CT is very good. I think CT and MRI are both complementary. Um, I'm a CT person. I, there's plenty of radiologists that, that you know, like to like MRI. I think MRCP, though, in this, in this, in this patient is very good in terms of defining bile duct anatomy. And when you have an MRCP with MRI with contrast, it's as good or better of uh, CT in terms of sensitivity and specificity. So again, endoscopy in these patients, making a diagnosis can be difficult. The farther that we are um, working away from the ampulla or the papilla, the harder it is for us to just to do about anything, and that pertains to both diagnosis and drainage. And you know, one unique aspect of cholangiocarcinoma, these these tumors are typically desmoplastic, and making a diagnosis can just be that more challenging. So how we do this is kind of a multimodality endoscopic approach, um, and we use basically any number of modalities to make a diagnosis. So endoscopic ultrasounds is a, is a big one, and that's this, you know, you can see um, here we're basically, with EUS, we're not we're not focusing on the inside of the GI tract. We're actually looking outside. So very easy, easy for us in here to look at the, through the duodenum, to look at the pancreas, the distal bile duct. But as we get up higher towards the hilum, this can be a little bit harder to, 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 to image. Um, but we're able to look at lymph nodes in this area. We get excellent views at the portal vein, the hepatic artery, which is, again, important in staging. So this is an EUS image here, and you can see this is a uh, this is the tumor here. Uh, it's the bile duct being basically replaced with tumor. This white thing here is probably a, I think it's a plastic stent. Here you can see the portal vein. This is probably the hepatic artery here. You can sample this with a needle here um, and and grab tissue from this directly with endoscopic ultrasound. One of the issues with endoscopic ultrasound, particularly with cholangiocarcinoma, is uh, tumor seeding. There's a famous paper, I think it's out of Mayo Clinic. They looked at 191 patients, and they underwent staging laparotomy prior to transplant uh, for cholangiocarcinoma. And what they found is that there was a high, small numbers, but still a higher incidence of peritoneal metastasis for those that underwent transduodenal fine needle biopsy because you are crossing the peritoneal plane. Now, for distal cholangiocarcinomas, that really doesn't because those patients are treated like pancreatic cancers and it's going to be typically within the operative field the duodenum's coming out with the pancreatic hodiduodenectomy. Not the case with the hyler or cholangiocarcinoma. So, the, you know, part of Mayo Clinic protocol is, you know, they exclude, the, if, if they've had a EUS with transduodenal fine needle um, biopsy or aspiration, it's actually exclusionary for transplant. And I, I also remind you that, you know, percutaneous bile duct Drainage um, does the same thing, crosses the peritoneal plane. That's also exclusionary. So if I have a young patient, I have had, I have had one patient in my practice several years ago. He was 48 and he had a Klatskins. Um, I avoided, you know, fine needle aspiration uh, just for this very reason. And he went on to transplant. So ERCP, this is the other workhorse in terms of endoscopy. And there's different ways, uh, again, how we, do, how we use ERCP. For, for making it, this is, you know, for diagnosis. And there's brushing, and there's, um, there's different types of brushing, cytology. Um, there's there's um, uh, biopsy. Um, now, just like with anything else in cancer, t 
tissue is the issue, so the more definitive stuff is brushings and biopsy. There's what we call optical biopsies, introductal ultrasounds, um, confocal laser endomicroscopy, which we'll touch briefly on. So cytology is great when it's positive, but when it's negative, and it usually is negative, that's where we're stuck. And there's different flavors of endoscopy, and the pathologist's favorite, I think, is typically right in the middle atypical, which really doesn't help us a lot, nor the pathologist, I mean, nor the uh, medical oncologist when it terms to making a diagnosis. Throw in some cholangitis, or if they have a stent, the, all this stuff causes artifact, and it can really wreak havoc on cytology. So there is FISH, which is advanced. It's, a, it's advanced uh, cytology. And what this looks at is aneuploidy, and which is positive in about 85% of bile duct cancers. And the, I think the assay that we use here is called Eurovision. And this basically looks at whether or not there's any gains in, in these chromosomes. And there's about four chromosomes that they look at. And this has about 60% sensitivity, so better than cytology alone and is additive. And here you can see this is a normal cell, two copies of each probe, two reds, two yellows, two blues, two greens, and this is polysomy. You can see here you got, uh, I think, four blues, uh, four yellows, uh, three reds, so this would be positive. And a positive fish in a non-PSC patient is virtually diagnostic of cholangiocarcinoma. So on to ERCP, uh, what else do we do? So cholangioscopy, very helpful. These are some, some views. This is typically what you see. Um, in this first slide over here, you'll see this is uh, these, these big tumor vessels. Uh, this is a classic finding that you see on cholangioscopy. This shows, sometimes you'll see a mass-like lesion. This is the more common, I think, is this, you get this fibrotic, a sclerotic appearance. And sometimes you get this appearance where you get these papillary fronds uh, and, and uh, exophytic tissue within the duct itself. So uh, there's a um, other uh, what we call optical biopsy, introductal ultrasound. Introductal ultrasound is a little bit different than endoscopic ultrasound. This is where actually we, we pass a 20 megahertz probe directly up into the bile duct. And uh, you can take ultrasound of the bile duct itself. This is very good, but again, you're not getting tissue. Um, confocal laser endomicroscopy has been around for uh, probably at least 15 years. And what this does is uses a low power laser that's passed up into the bile duct. You inject IV fluorescein, and with a low power laser, you're basically getting mic uh, microscopy. So here's a, um, uh, a normal um, uh, case, and this is an abnormal case. The problem with this is that there's very poor inter observer agreement. Again, you don't have any de definitive tissue. And so I think this is one of the limitations, and still even in my practice, I, I, I struggle where to, where, to, where, where to implement this. So what about the future? What other ways can we help with diagnosis? So um, I just think in every GI journal, um, there's an article about artificial intelligence, and this is showing a flat polyp here picked up with AI. This is something in the future that I, I'm sure is going is to help with diagnosis for these types of cancers. There's circulating uh, tumor uh, cells. Um, and there's actually circulating tumor cell DNA. These are great tests, but unfortunately, they're only positive typically when the patient has advanced disease. So still got some work to do with this, but, but being studied. So last part is to drain or not to drain. This is a really complex question, and I really think it's institution independent. It really depends on your your surgeons, depends on the patient case, depends on your interventional radiologist in terms of what's the best way and when to do it. So in the preoperative setting, it's really controversial. In fact, there's some data, particularly the Europeans, that will avoid biliary drainage. Um, there's been some data suggesting that this decreases RGR resections and really does nothing for uh, postoperative morbidity or mortality. However, if you have a patient that you need to treat medically or wait, um, maybe they want to be, they need to go embolization of the portal vein on one side, um, drainage could be important. I would say that the only real definitive um, indication for drainage is cholangitis. But whenever we instrument these, instrument these patients, whether it's percutaneously or endoscopically, there's always a risk of cholangitis. So even that's a little questionable. So when we do this, the goal is to drain 50% of the liver. Some pearls are you want to avoid draining atrophic segments. So sometimes you'll see an atrophic segment. has been blocked for a while. It's nothing but dilated ducts. You're going to gather, get nothing from draining that segment and just 
increase the risk of infection. There's different ways to drain it. You, you can do this with one stent, two stents, metal stents, plastic stents. And let's not forget ERCP is not without risk. Last thing you want to do is someone that's got a preoperative, it's preoperative is give them a bad case of pancreatitis, worst case duodenal perforation, uh, et cetera. So in drainage, um, draining bismuth ones are very easy. This is how we drain most pancreatic cancers. One stent will basically drain both lobes of the liver. We'll leave the stent right below the hilum. The rest of two, threes, and fours, we typically have to cross the hilum, and this um, you know, adds to the complexity of the case. Certainly adds to fluoroscopy time as well. Um, this is a schematic just showing um, unilateral drainage with a metal stent, plastic stent, two metal stents, side-by-side -side technique, um, two plastic stents, side-by-side -side technique. So um, metal versus plastic. So in a, I would argue that in a preoperative setting, we really do not, I, metal is probably not the best thing. So these usually get plastic stents. And palliation, I think there's no question that you know metal stents are, are indicated and are actually really good. They're associated with longer patency, um, lower therapeutic failure, and there's less reintervention rates. Yes, there's probably a cost in the short term, but in the long term with, these, with decreased uh, hospitalizations, morbidity, and procedures, it probably is cost effective as well. So when we drain these patients, do we drain one side, both sides? This is controversial. There was one meta-analysis that compared bilateral versus unilateral, and this was metal stenting, so palliative, and uh, showed better clinical success rate and reduced incidence of stent dysfunction in the bilateral group. However, there's another study that looked at 187 patients, and this, irrespective of the business classification, basically um, showed there was a higher incidence of complications and death in the bi bilateral group. One other thing you can do is create what's called a Y stent. Now, um, this, there's a, this stent I don't think is commercially available here in the U.S. There's a stent that you, it's got these extra long struts, so you basically put this stent in one system and then deploy another stent through these struts and create a, what's called a Y stent. We don't typically, we don't have this stent here, but you can do the same thing with this struts, but it can be challenging. And um, again, there's really um, no difference comparing side-by-side -side metal stents versus Y stents in terms of efficacy, drainage, complications, et cetera. So whatever one works um, uh, is usually what we do. So let's not forget about our interventional radiologists. So percutaneous biliary drainage, um, you know, definitely uh, as a role in, in, in some of these patients. Um, I think there's some data, and even my personal, you know, uh, I agree with this, is that I think percutaneous clangiography can be better at determining the proximal extent of the tumor, which can be important in terms of resection. But again, there's this issue with tumor seeding. So um, one study said 5% of patients had tumor seeding. I've had seen patients show up year or two later after surgery and have uh, a bump under their skin at their percutaneous site and biopsy and it's cancer. So, you know, this is a real number. Um, there's a lot of other complications with percutaneous drainage. I've seen all of these, um, infection, portal venous thrombosis, the dreaded hemobilia, um, pleural fusions, usually, you know, when they're, when they're draining from the right side, uh, they'll, they'll hit the pleura. One study actually looked, this was a pre, in a pre-surgical pre preoperative study and was stopped short because there's a higher morbidity or mortality actually in the percutaneous group. So this actually study was stopped, it's a European study. So there are some endoscopic salvage uh, techniques. Um, this is predominantly for the left lobe of the liver. So um, this is, um, here you can see a dilated duct in the left liver. If you can't get to the duodenum, if they have altered anatomy or the duodenum's obstructed, um, you can sometimes you can image the left system and drain um, the left system uh, across the stomach wall. Um, so deploy a stent and basically do like a, a, a bypass um, and drain the left segment of the liver uh, into the into the stomach. So briefly, uh, treatment. So there are there's treatment uh, RFA. RF, there's probably more data with HEC uh, than anything else when it comes to RFA. And this basically is just it's a it's a it's a a probe that we can place up into the bile duct and actually, you know, uh, um, basically treat the tumor. Um, this has been around for a long time. Again, where this fits into treatment, you know, uh, where it fits into an individual, you know, patient's treatment, you know, plan is, 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 is it really depends. It's a multidisciplinary discussion. Um, but sometimes uh, it, 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 uh, it, we can do this. I use it 
for uh, ampullary tumors that extend into the bile duct. That's where I've used it in my experience. So finishing up here, um, so back to our patient. He's got this uh, bismuth 3A stricture here. So Dr. Sakandi was very specific when he called me and said, um, I, uh, you know, I, this patient I think is surgical. Um, I want to uh, preserve the left system. It's going to be a right hepatectomy, so if you can drain the right system. So we took him, and um, here you can see this is the EUS, and I can barely see the bile duct here. Um, it is basically replaced with soft tissue, again, consistent with tumor. Um, here you got the extra hepatic portal vein, uh, the hepatic artery here. And this is what the cholangioscopy looked like. So um, here's the cystic duct. It's a wire in the bile duct there. And here you can see what the endoscopic views look like. And here you got these tumor vessels. This is the actual tumor here. It's got the sclerotic appearance. This didn't come out so good, but you have this was I passed the this spy scope directly into the into this stricture up into the right system. And these are actually the secondary branches. So you can see this thing really extends up high into the right system. So here's the ERCP, had a really long extra paddock bile duct. Um, this is a cystic duct here. I got a wire in the right system. You can see a little trickle of contrast come over here um, uh, into the left system. Um, with a little bit of luck and perseverance, in the bottom of the ninth inning, we were able to actually get a wire into the left system. And um, so um, we then, uh, you know, since he's preoperative, we put two plastic stents in him. And uh, um, so here's the pathology. Um, and again, uh, you can see uh, on this, uh, a lot of uh, fibrosis here, uh, tumor cells here. So in this case, the cytology was negative, the fish was negative, but the histology was positive. So we made a diagnosis. And um, this was just a CT afterwards, um, showing that the stents right where right where they need to be. Uh, no more dilation in the left system. He's got a little bit in the right system over here. I think segment five and six. And he, I think, went on to surgery and had a T2 N0 lesion uh, recently. So in summary, you know, treatment of cholangiocarcinoma, it's really a multidisciplinary uh, approach when it comes to treatment. Obviously, endoscopy has an important role in diagnosis, and we do that with endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP. Whether or not to drain really depends in the, if it's palliative, if it's preoperative. And again, I think it's, it's dependent on what, um, uh, it, it depends on the institution you're at. So with that, thank you. I'd like to next introduce Dr. Aswanto Sekundi. Dr. Sekundi is a board certified surgeon with dual fellowship training in hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery, as well as advanced gastrointestinal minimally invasive surgery. He is the division chief of HPB surgery here at Advent Health Tampa, is one of the very few surgeons who performs advanced minimally invasive robotic liver resections for malignant and benign tumors. Please help me welcome him to the stage to discuss the minimally invasive treatment and clinical outcomes following a Kalaskin tumor resection. Dr. Secundi. Thank you for uh, nice introductions. And uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, setting up the ground for this talk. I'm uh, extremely uh, lucky to have Mike in our program because I can tell you this uh, endoscopic treatment for uh, perihalar cholangic carcinoma is probably one of the hardest. We keep uh, receiving patients who had uh, ERCP done, and then someone put the CBD stand below the hilar obstructions, which is like cosmetic drain, you know? Doesn't do anything. The obstructions up here, they put the stand here, it's perfect. So uh, I'll, I'll share with you a modern minimal invasive treatment and clinical outcome of a clad skin or perihalar cholangic carcinoma. This is one of the hardest, probably, tumor to treat in uh, HPB pancreatic surgery. So just introductions, uh, like I said, it's most technically difficult HPP cases. A lot of patients are, are unresectable when they came in, 
because uh, this tumor occurs in a very uh, tight space, very close to the hepatic artery pole vein, and many times the tumor goes into those structures and um, uh, they have uh, perineural uh, lymphatic invasions. They raise a question of radial margins. You can get negative margins up top, but how about the radial, because this is touching. Um, and they have, you know, a, a good chance of uh, tumor recurrence locally, and this operation also needs the biliary resection and reconstruction in addition to the major hepatic resection. And um, therefore, uh, most of the operation is done open. The reason why we talk about minimal invasive here, just to alert everyone that this is possible. We still do open, of course. Um, the morphological type of clad skin tumor, there are three main types. Mass forming, this is the blocking one. Patient come uh, early with jaundice. The second type is a periductal infiltrating. It walk along the wall of the bile duct, but it's still flowing, the inside. And then the third is introductal type. This is the lucky people. Introductal type is the highest uh, cure rate because it's, it's only in the mucosa of the bile duct. It is not really in the wall of it, so they, they don't go outside the bile duct, so the cure rate is high. So uh, this is a classical findings, uh, a CAT scan with a dilated bile duct, like Mike mentioned earlier, MRI, MRCP, you can see intrahepatic duct is dilated and there's a disconnection right and left. It's like there's a missing segment there. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, anatomical challenges because the bile duct, portal vein, hepatic artery, which feeds the liver, they're in contact with the bile duct. So any tumor in the bile duct, they will easily go into those structures. The second uh, challenge to this is we have to think about how much liver to preserve. Remember, people can live without pancreas, people can live without colon, but can't live without liver. So the, 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 the function of liver has to be preserved, otherwise the patient with liver failure postoperatively. Um, this is a classification of the uh, clad skin, like Mike mentioned. The location is very important to know, and um, this determines the uh, extent of the operation, the difficulty, and also the prognosis. This is how the operation is done. So you can see here on, on, the, on the left uh, 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 picture, you can see here the right side of the liver has been taken out, so it's missing right lobe. So we are preserving the, only, the left side of the liver with hepatic artery going to the left and one outflow. So they, they can, cannot be a hiccup in this because uh, the patient is living with a, a single uh, uh, pipe in, pipe out. So now the, the picture on the right is on the, on, the, on the contralateral aspect of it. And you can see here the, um, the, the bile duct has been cut. So this bile duct has, be, has to be put together uh, with uh, a reconstruction technique with a small bowel. So now I get this question a lot, how to put back the bile duct? So this is the general, in general term, this is how you put the bile duct together. And even in reference transfer, sometimes people do this as well. So you can see here, we, we, we bring a loop of jejunum, small bowel, and then we, we suture it to the bile duct as long as the margin is negative. So there are a couple ways of, of doing this in order to uh, be able to reach the hilar plate. And sometimes this can be challenging in obese patients. So now, uh, so, so a bit about the data. What happened in 10 years after resection of this cholangiocarcinoma? You can see here the four factors that determine survival. Type of cancer, tumor differentiation, where the lymph nodes involve, and the margins. The picture on the right, bismuth one to three, has actually better prognosis than bismuth four. Bismuth four is both sides of, of uh, bile duct is dilated. It's hard to get negative margin on those, so therefore, it's not surprising, the, the survival is not, it's not as good as the one, two, and three. The patient who has a, a, a poorly differentiated tumor, obviously, uh, they don't do so well long term. Uh, the patient who had the R0 uh, margin live longer. That's why we are trying to get R0 margin as, as uh, every time as possible. And the uh, patient that has uh, a lymph node involvement Obviously, the outcome is not as good as uh, N0 uh, patient. And this operation requires a full lymphadenectomy. The AGCC8 requires uh, at least six of the lymph node being in the, in the specimen for this in order to get a good assessment of the lymph node status. So now, this operation has been traditionally done open, and even nationwide is done open. When it came to Tampa, obviously, we do this a lot of open. For some reason, these kind of cases tend to come to a center. They do a lot of liver surgery, and a lot of people do not want to do this. So very quickly in our service, we accumulated a lot of this patient, even from TGH, clad skin tumor, because people don't want to do this. Now the challenge are, 
in order to do, even open is hard. Now we're doing minimal invasively. The challenge are, it requires a significant experience in both liver section major and also have to put back the bowel duct minimal invasively. Uh, location, uh, determined difficulty, and uh, we only have one shot to do this. It is not like, okay, we, we do surgery, uh, a year later, patient recurrent, let's re resect. <laughs> not resect in one shot. You do it now, and then that's it. Now, <clears throat> there have been uh, some uh, report from China, high volume set in China. They tried to do it laparoscopically. The outcome is bad. You can see here, laparoscopically, which is kind of crazy, 35% conversion rate because of the technical difficulties. 35% transfusion rate. R1 margin is 30%. That's a lot of R1 margin, my God. 5% mortality rate. Whipple mortality is 1%. This is 5%. And long-term outcome also not very good with the laparoscopic because the surgeon was not able to really clean up the area and get the clean margins. As expected, so overall survival is not as good with laparoscopic and also uh, tumor recur a lot uh, earlier. Now, because we know this, we, we, we tried to do a robotic technique for class skin tumor resection. We published several papers uh, about the technique and analysis of surgical oncology, uh, GR surgery. And you can see a couple of publications from our center uh, regarding a, a baldic section for a class skin resection. This is our uh, 15, this is a landmark paper we wrote, 15 patients, first patient, uh, first uh, series of 15 patients of robotic class skin tumor resection, published, um, I think, two years ago or so. And you can see here, uh, 15 patients, outcome is, is quite good, operative time is eight and a half hours. This is a long operation, even open is long operation. And uh, um, length of stay is reasonable, I would say, uh, four to six days uh, without mortality. Now. There's some technical issues. A lot of patients come with a very obese abdomen. This makes it difficult to reconstruct the bowel duct because there's so much fat in there. Uh, a lot of times they get tension between the bowel duct and the bowel, and it will affect the post-operative recovery. I, I want to show you some video here of how the operation is done. I like to show video so people have a mental picture of how this is done. A lot of uh, GI doctor or um, medical doctor, they thought it's like rocket science, you know, to do this. So. This, this operation actually is done routinely in our center. Um, you can see here we, we use the robotic system. We, have, we cut those bile ducts uh, very precisely. We have the energy device to really um, uh, uh, remove those lymph nodes. And, um, you know, we, we almost have the same instrument as open operation in order to um, uh, skeletonize. If something uh, bleeds, we can go and put a quick stitch on it. You see a, a video on the right. We are trying to get margins. For, uh, for Dr. Shi to uh, examine the margin. And uh, this is an operation that requires a lot of um, collaboration with pathology. Sometimes we send like five specimens. And, um, you know, frozen section goes all the time. This is how it is. And you can see here, after we take this out, we have to put back the bile duct. And um, uh, we have uh, several techniques of sometimes you end up with two bile ducts. So you have to put those bile ducts together in order to do a single anastomosis. Sometimes you cannot put those bile together. You have the two separate anastomoses, which increases the chance of leak postoperatively. So as we know, bile leak um, uh, increases the hospital uh, uh, duration and also increases mortality, actually. At, at some point, some people, they leak bile, and they will never recover from the abscess from the bile leak. So if, if possible, we try not to have bile leak from, from the beginning. You can see here we are reconstructing the bile duct, a very tiny bile duct, um, that we usually do is open to reconstruct it, and now we're, uh, we have transitioned to a minimal invasive to reconstruct it. So we offer this operation in a routine basis in our program. On, on the right panel, we are um, uh, uh, resecting um, a bile duct end block with the left side of the liver, all the way down to the kefa, including a caudal lobe. So this operation um, requires a lot of times in the OR, usually for me, three bathroom breaks. To, to finish this operation, <laughs> so painful. But, but it's good for the patient. So this is all about the patient. So, so it's, it's usually an all-day procedure, central line, A line, everything. And, um, you know, we have uh, scrub tech changed three times. Surgeon's still the same, you know. <laughs> so we are, we are putting back the bile duct you can see on the right panel. 
So this is uh, just a different type. You can see here the, the systems really facilitate uh, ability to perform this operation well. Um, this is just another uh, uh, video of uh, how we put the Baldac together. You can see here some of the liver transplant also use the same technique. Uh, as you know, liver surgery and liver transplant are very, very close together. So now this is a, just a quick uh, summary of uh, our experience here. We have done probably 75 open here. This is just the robotic. Um, the, the patient profile is just like any patient's. Uh, operative duration, 458 minutes, EBL 150. Uh, we're able to uh, secure 23R0. Two patients had to go to R1 because it's really involved and there's no way to know from the beginning. This is why I, I, I always speak with Mike. What he tells me is very important. If he says the tumor is climbing far into the right lobe, it means I, I need to know that. I need to know that uh, because we need to plan the operation accordingly, right? The worst thing that can happen is the tumor is climbing to the right side and surgeon did not know it and he took off the left side. Has it happened before? Of course, all the time. P people take the wrong lobe, you know, and you cannot put it back. So it is, it is very important to, to trust your uh, GI doctor and also to have a very, very, very accurate assessment of this. Uh, Postoperative uh, profile is uh, quite uh, acceptable, I think, and the uh, length of follow-up is about two years. So uh, postoperative complication is quite low. This operation takes a lot to recover. Sometimes people, three months later, they said, I'm still tired. I said, yeah, that's about right, you know. This is a big operation. So the conclusion, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, with all the advances, uh, surgery is still the only option for cure. Chemotherapy is good, but usually don't cure people. You, ha you have to cut it up. Surgery uh, usually involves both resection and, uh, of the bile duct and the liver, and um, robotic can be an alternative to open. However, it needs to be done in the center that has a high volume and expertise in, in doing this operation. Thank you. Our fourth and final session of the day, I'd like to introduce Dr. Faiza Manji. Dr. Manji is a medical oncologist from the Florida Cancer Specialist and Research Institute. She is board certified in internal medicine and hematology and oncology. Today, she will be discussing oncological treatment for advanced colorectal cancer with liver metastasis. Dr. Manji. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Faiza Manji with uh, Florida uh, cancer specialist. So I'm going to talk about um, oncologic treatment of stage four colorectal cancer with liver metastases and how to administer optimum chemotherapy. It's a nice topic after a heavy lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little background on colorectal cancer. It's estimated that approximately 151,000 new cases of large bowel cancer are diagnosed annually in the U.S., of, of which approximately 106,000 arise from the colon and the remainder from the rectum. Um, approximately 52,580 uh, Americans are expected to die of large bowel cancer uh, each year, although the CRC mortality has been progressively declining since 1990 at a current rate of approximately uh, 1.6 or 2% per year. It's still the third most common cause of cancer-related death in women in the U.S. and the second leading cause of death in men. Unfortunately, the incidence of CRC in men and women less than age 50 has steadily increased at a rate of 2.1% per year from 1992 through 2012 and has continued to increase since then. Uh, through 2015, there was a 30% increase in CRC in 40-year-olds. Uh, these increases are predominantly by left-sided cancers in general and left uh, rectal cancer in particular. Current literature suggests that over 86% of those diagnosed under the age of 50 are symptomatic at diagnosis, and this is associated with a more advanced uh, stage at diagnosis and a poorer outcome. Um, approximately 50 to 60% of patients with CRC develop colorectal metastases, and 80 to 90% of these patients have unresectable metastatic liver disease. Uh, metastatic uh, disease most frequently develops metachronous, which means that the recurrence occurs in the liver following resection of the primary tumor after treatment for the local regional uh, colorectal cancer. However, 20 to 24% of patients with CRC present with synchronous liver mets. 
And some evidence indicates that synchronous liver metastases um, is associated with a more disseminated disease state and a worse prognosis. Um, there are certain clinical pathologic factors, such as the presence of extrahepatic metastases, the presence of more than three tumors, and a disease-free interval of less than 12 months has been associated with a poor prognosis in patients with um, colorectal cancer. Um, for patients with potentially resectable metastases, surgical resection is the treatment of choice when feasible. Um, among patients with four or fewer isolated hepatic lesions, five-year survival rates range from 28 to 58 percent, averaging 40. Many of these patients are potentially cured. So um, the question is how to convert to resectability in metastatic CRC. So as I said, majority of the patients that are diagnosed with metastatic colorectal cancer have unresectable disease. However, if they have liver-limited unresectable disease that because of involvement of critical structures cannot be resected unless regression is accomplished, Preoperative systemic chemotherapy is being increasingly considered in highly selected cases in an attempt to downsize colorectal mets and convert them to resectable, and this is known as conversion therapy, which is different than neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which is when you give to patients who you know that are going to be cured of disease. This is an unresectable or metastatic disease when you're giving still chemo in the neoadjuvant setting, but it's a different sort of label to it. Um, any active metastatic systemic regimen can be used in an attempt to convert a patient that's unresectable to resectable because the goal is not specifically to eradicate the micrometastatic disease, but rather to obtain optimal size regression um, of the visible METs. And there's obviously a concern for chemo-associated liver injury, including severe sinusoidal dilatation and steatohepatitis that's associated with morbidity and complications following a hepatectomy. Um, to limit the development of uh, hepatotoxicity, it is therefore recommended that surgery should be performed as soon as possible as the patient becomes resectable. So I mentioned this term conversion therapy that's been proposed to designate the use of induction chemo in patients with isolated but unresectable um, colorectal liver, liver mets. And so in uh, several reports, um, a few prospective uncontrolled studies and retrospective series, um, there's a wide variability in the patients who um, were deemed initially unresectable hepatic mets who had then a subjective objective response to permit subsequent R0 resection. And the range was 12 to 83 percent, partially probably because it's sort of liver surgeon dependent. Maybe they were somewhat resectable, and, but they deemed them unresectable initially. And the five-year survival rates for patients who successfully undergo later surgery average 30 to 35 percent, which is results that are substantially better than, the, um, than those who just have chemotherapy alone, where the five-year survival is 20 percent, even with the most active regimens. So here's sort of a flow sheet of um, what to um, sort of look at when you're trying to decide whether a patient should be taken for um, resectable versus given upfront chemo. And basically, the big thing here is if they have any of these criteria, then you should really put them for initial chemotherapy, meaning if they have more than four metastases in the liver, if they have substantial um, disease in both lobes, or there's suspicion for portal node involvement, if they're RAS or BRAF mutation positive, or if the surgeon feels that initial chemotherapy would uh, give them um, a less extensive operation, then you give upfront chemo. Uh, the need for a fiducial placement, so um, modern chemotherapy has become very highly effective in metastatic C CRC, and sometimes patients will apparently have complete radiographic response to neoadjuvant chemo. However, even with the most effective regimens, pa complete pathologic response only after neoadjuvant chemo only occurs in 4 to 9 percent of cases. Um, the majority of radiographic completely responding lesions, 83% um, uh, in one series still had viable tumor. Thus, even in the setting of where they may have radiographic complete clinical response, uh, resection is still needed. So in order to locate these disappearing liver metastases at the time of resection, liver metastases that are less than, one, less than two centimeters in diameter or located more than one centimeter deep in the liver, um, parenco may be marked with a fiducial marker such as a coil before initiation of neoadjuvant chemo. Um, I'm not going to try to go too much into chemo, but I have to bring some chemo into this, and I will talk about a few biologic agents as well. But basically, if you see that if a patient has unresectable, um, you know, synchronous mets with liver or lung metastases, 
Um, basically, you can give any kind of metastatic regimen that we give, which is full theory, full FOX, these are doublet chemo backgrounds or triplet even chemo background, plus or minus bevacizumab, um, which I'll talk about later. And then essentially what you want to do is that you want to re basically reevaluate them every two months to see if conversion to resectability is a reasonable goal. Um, and then regardless of the specific regimen, preoperative cycles should be restricted to no more than four months because of the potential for liver toxicity. Um, and like I said, the optimal regimen has not been established, and most of the time what we use is what we use in metastatic um, colorectal cancer uh, in patients who are unresectable. So the doublet chemos that I mentioned, either oxaliplatinum or irinotecan plus 5-FU are essentially equivalent in terms of, um, for patients with metastatic CRC, the choice is typically governed by toxicity profile. Um, Oxaliplatinum-based chemo is generally preferred for most patients who have not, who are chemo-naive. Um, but you can, and you can use full theory for patients who've actually received adjuvant um, oxaliplatinum in the previous 12 months. Um, whether higher resectability can be achieved using regimens that contain both oxaliplatinum and arenotecan and 5-FU, which is known as full FOX theory, is unclear. Um, higher rates of successful liver resection have been reported in some trials, but not in others. And I'll talk about one trial in particular that, that's come to be shown. Uh, nevertheless, full FOX theory is a reasonable choice for young, healthy patients who are able to tolerate it. Um, so now, when I'm talking about uh, biologic agents, I'm mainly referring to cetuximab, um, panitumumab, and bevacizumab. So the benefit of these agents, these biologic agents and metastatic uh, CRC, when you're trying to take them for surgery, is not uh, conclusive. Um, whether you should, um, they say, it may uh, make them more receptible, but that has consequences to it. So. The benefit of adding the chemotherapy background to a be, may be counterbalanced by the high cost and the potential for added toxicity, particularly with bevacizumab. And these uh, anti-EGFR agents, cetuximab and panitumumab, so uh, patients who have RAS, BRAF mutations, these, are, these patients are essentially, um, uh, it's, it's not recommended to give cetuximab and panitumumab to patients who have these positive mutations. Um, and patients who are considered wild type, the benefit of adding these agents targeting the EGFR is modest at best. And there was a trial that came out in 2020 called the New Epoch trial, where basically patients who had operable liver mets were given full FOX either with cetuximab or without three months before and three months after surgery. And cetuximab was actually associated with a significantly, oh, sorry, significantly um, worse um, PFS of 14.5 months versus 24.4 um, months in the latest update. So therefore, NCCN recommends that you do not give cetuximab in the perioperative setting because it may actually harm the patient. And the two, this is further complicated um, by primary tumor sightedness. So what we're finding also is that accumulating data suggesting that the primary tumor site um, is it sort of also guides whether or not you would use these agents. Um, so uh, tumors that arise in the right side of the colon actually derive no benefit from these anti-EGFR bodies for initial therapy, even if they're RAS or BRAF wild type. Um, so thus, it's only advised to use these anti-EGFR agents on patients who have left-sided primary tumor that are RAS, BRAF wild type. And in regards to bevacizumab, the benefits of adding that um, with initially unresectable liver mets has been addressed in two studies. There was a randomized phase two trial where the addition of the biologic agent um, chosen based on the RAS mutation status to a chemotherapy doublet backbone regimen for patients with initially unre unresectable CRC liver mets did not significantly increase the fraction who were subsequently able to undergo a complete or microscopically complete um, R0 slash R1 resection. It was four, 57 versus 48 percent, and the median overall survival was 43 versus 40 months. Um, this was a trial that actually is not even uh, completed yet, but it's a Cairo 5 trial. Um, it's, so there was a preliminary report that was presented at the 2022 ASCO annual meeting. Um, basically, what it was is that they were sort of touting the superiority of full, fo full FOXIRI, which is a triplet chemo background plus bevacizumab um, 
for patients with initially unresectable colorectal cancer with metastases li limited to the liver. They were right-sided and they were RAS, BRAF mutated, which we know is a more aggressive type of colon cancer. Um, there was almost 300 patients included in this study and basically everybody received uh, bevacizumab, but it was like either they received the triplet backbone, uh, chemo backbone, or they received the two uh, drug backbone for up to six months followed by a maintenance treatment. And what they found is, is that in the preliminary report, they said, okay, the median follow-up of 41 months, the primary, which was the primary, the median uh, PFS of uh, progression-free survival was modestly better with full Fox Fury, 10.6 versus nine months, and the overall response rate was 52 versus 32%. And they also said that there was a higher rate of secondary complete or microscopically complete resection with or without ablation. It was 51 versus 37. But this all came out as a very significant high cost. There was um, more grade three treatment-related toxicity, especially neutropenia and diarrhea. There were two grade five, meaning fatal toxicities uh, with full Fox series versus none in the doublet regimen. And there was also severe post-op, uh, the rate of severe post-op complications was also higher in the triplet group, 27 versus 15. Um, including three post-op deaths in the triplet, and there was none in the doublet. So I feel like this is why oncology is so nuanced. You know, they have all these other benefits, but then they come at a very high cost. And again, uh, this was just some of the recommendations for the chemo regimens that can be used, and essentially the big takeaway is that the patient should just be reevaluated every two months to see if um, resectability is a goal. I mean, if they are resectable, if that's the goal. So what if the patients have uh, liver lesions that are from deemed resectable from the beginning? Um, so basically, I, it, I had that in the other slide where I showed if they had more than four liver metastases and if they had bilober disease or RAS, BRAF mutated, um, you do neoadjuvant chemo. But if they're medically fit and they have four or fewer lesions and no BRAF um, or RAS mutation, then you should do surgery upfront over neoadjuvant. And again, that's also not absolute, and I'll show you why. Um, so the reason, though, why we want to take them up front is because of the concerns about liver toxicity and the higher risks, uh, rates of perioperative morbidity um, in patients undergoing resection after receiving oxaliplatinum or irinotecan-based neoadjuvant chemo, and the lack of controlled trials demonstrating a survival benefit for perioperative chemo, particularly in cases when patients have small uh, resectable mets in the liver. So, the, but the question is, is even though that's the recommendation, could there be some argument um, to maybe give them some chemo? And, you know, this is, I guess, you know, this is why we have the tumor boards and there can always be a discussion about it. So there is no, dis no consensus on what to do if the patients definitively have resectable uh, liver meds. I mean, we generally take them for surgery, but at some centers, they are giving two to three cycles of pre-op chemo. Um, to nearly all patients, even if they have um, resectable liver mets, in particular those patients who are most likely to benefit from resection. And the idea behind that is that if you give systemic chemo, it will allow early aggressive disease progression to become manifest, um, followed by reevaluation for surgery. So if they have widespread disease progression, despite giving them a couple cycles of chemo, then you know that they probably would not have benefited from the surgery at all. Um, if, on the other hand, they did respond with the chemo, then you know that that you should be probably proceeding with, or you definitely should be proceeding with surgery. Um, in terms of the toxicities that, we're, that I keep talking about, so um, oxaliplatinum causes hepatic sinusoidal abnormalities uh, termed uh, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. It's also been described and similar to those that characterize venoocclusive disease. Irenotecan is more often associated with uh, steatosis or steatohepatitis. And bevacizumab can, causes impaired wound healing and possibly impaired hepatic regeneration. So it may affect the safety of a metastastectomy, particularly if performed too soon after administration. For this reason, it's common to wait at least four weeks after giving um, bevacizumab before you take them to surgery. It's actually preferable to even wait up to six to eight weeks before you take them to surgery. Um, and following the surgery, the best post-operative strategy is still uncertain. Um, in the absence of any pa published randomized trials to guide clinical practice, we basically still give them six months um, course of an oxaliplatinum containing regimen. I mean, the total perioperative period should be six months, um, except patients who received adjuvant oxaliplatinum-based chemo in the prior 12 months. 
And um, for patients who are rendered free of disease, post-treatment surveillance is warranted if they should be, would be considered candidates for a second potentially curative surgical procedure. So NCCN guidelines basically treats them how you would, like a patient who's had surgery and essentially been cured. Uh, you do CEA testing every three to six months for two years, then every six months for three years. You do a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis um, every three to six months for two years, and then every six to 12 months for up to five years. And a colonoscopy is done in one year. If no ad advanced adenoma, then repeat in three years and then five years. And the majority of patients with resected uh, isolated liver mets from CRC will develop recurrences in the liver and the lung, which could potentially be treated with further resection, in particular the liver, uh, if the liver is the only site of recurrence, is, is the only site of recurrence in 35 to 40 percent of cases. Um, Five-year survival rates are up to 43 percent are reported following repeat liver resection for a second a recurrence with acceptable morbidi morbidity and perioperative mortality, which is you know significantly higher than what I reported earlier, which is when you just give chemo alone, the five-year survival rate is about 20 percent. And just uh, to finalize like, some of the key points that I mentioned, that you know you can give neoadjuvant, um, but uh, we do give neoadjuvant chemo, uh, and basically you reevaluate them every two months and um, try to not go past four months if you can. Um, this new adjuvant chemo is known as conversion therapy. Um, basically, the minimum amount of chemo would be best, you know, in the perioperative or postoperative setting. And, um, you know, oxaliplatinum causes sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, and irinotecan is known to cause steatohepatitis. I'd like to next introduce Dr. Kim Wynn. Dr. Wynn is a double board certified in colon and rectal surgery and general surgery and fellowship trained in colon and rectal surgery specializing in minimally invasive surgery. Today, she will be discussing the resection of colorectal cancer with liver metastasis and how to best optimize oncological outcomes in collaboration with your liver surgeon. Dr. Wynn. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Thank you for having me talk. So um, this is uh, how to optimize surgical outcomes uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Sakonda here. So um, and really, when you it's similar to what Dr. Harris said during the discussion with the Klaskin uh, tumors of the liver. Is like with these very difficult diseases, it's a multidisciplinary um, process. You have uh, discussions among. This, uh, various surgeons, liver, colon, oncology, to optimize um, um, patients for um, good prognosis. And um, if it involves the rectum, then uh, oftentimes that includes uh, radiation oncology as well. So it's a team effort. Um, and then we'll go through the numbers. I guess the numbers vary according to um, which sources you uh, derive from. But again, it is uh, the third. Um, most common cancer, um, and approximately 33 to 35% of patients with uh, colorectal cancer will develop metastases in um, the course of their disease. A third of them will develop liver metastases when three years after diagnosis. And similar to Klatskin's skin, uh, Klatskin tumor, its surgery is really the only chance of long-term survival. And resection of liver metastases has been shown to in 20 to 25% of individuals to um, confer around a uh, 10 year uh, interval of disease free um, survival. And the goal of the surgery is with any surgery of cancer is to um, achieve negative histological margins. Again, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, management uh, strategies are often discussed at tumor board so that it can be tailored to each individual's case. And so this is. Um, pretty significant discussion of whether to receive chemotherapy preoperatively, uh, whether to go with surgery first, and whether to do um, simultaneous surgery versus doing colon or colon first or liver first. And um, we've shown um, through advancement in chemotherapy and surgery itself that there's enhanced prognosis and prolongation of median survival. 
Um, in certain cases, if it's an is isolated um, liver lesion organ, uh, resection can confer up to 71% five-year overall survival. So again, uh, it's very important for R0 resection, microscopically margin negative resection. Um, it uh, it um, gives you an idea of whether uh, if you do have not negative margins, increased risk of recurrence and also um, decrease in disease and um, long-term survival. So Dr. Um, Dr. Sakandi has already discussed about how uh, liver remnants are determined and whether they are resectable or not. So in classification of uh, metastatic colorectal liver METs, um, they fall into three groups at diagnosis, whether you can clearly resect them. Number two, if you can make them resect, uh, resectable um, with conversion therapy, as was discussed by Dr. Manji, or if they are unresectable. And oftentimes that can be defined as um, during preoperative chemotherapy, oftentimes given um, several months um, beforehand to see if how aggressive the disease is. So we talked about extrahepatic metastases. Before, they thought that if you had uh, extra um, hepatic diseases, uh, lesions, that they would be unresectable, but that's not uh, so the case. So at this time, if you, um, according to the Japanese Society of Cancer of Colorectal in 2010, they updated it to 2019, but the guidelines actually are the same. So for liver, pertaining to colon cancer and liver lesions alone, if they can be resected, do so. Because the efficacy of um, survival with resection of liver and lung lesions, uh, in certain cases as well, um, do confer um, disease-free and long-term survival. The prognostic factors, so Dr. Manji um, looked into some of these as well, um, talking about, you know, um, liver portal lymph node metastases, number of metastases, and what the prognosis is with that, with the pathology degree of differentiation. And whether during resection, if you have less than a centimeter uh, margins, um, in discussion of high CEA before hepatectomy, or uh, again, disease-free duration less than one year, can be poor prognosis. And also, response to chemotherapy is important because um, if they progress in chemotherapy, survival rates are around 8% five years out. So colorectal and liver resection. So this is often uh, the timing. There was a long discussion, like looking at the literature over 20 years, as to which goes first. You do it at the same time? Do you do the liver first? Do you do the um, colon first? Well, uh, various studies, one at Memorial Sloan Kettering and, um, and others, have shown that if you can do it together at the same time, then there's decreased hospital stay, decreased lo uh, blood loss, and also decreased uh, morbidity. And also it goes into convenience, uh, timing, and also cost. Um, and there isn't any difference. However, um, it really pertains to how much has to be resected. And, um, and nowadays, if it's a uh, small colorectal lesion that can be resected along with a small hepatectomy. Oftentimes, um, it's encouraged that um, it will, uh, a simultaneous resection is um, conducted. However, if you have a large um, hepatectomy that has to be done, then oftentimes that can be done first and then followed by um, the primary lesion. The argument with individuals who for um, primary first in the past is uh, concerned about, you know, advancement of disease and such. And um, nowadays, oftentimes we resect it only if uh, complications arise from the lesion itself. So whether there's bleeding, perforation, eh, and such. Um, but previous studies have been shown coming out of, of Mayo and others showed that with the primary lesion, if it's not symptomatic, you don't necessarily have to resect them because um, only around 3%, three, between 3 to 15% end up with, um, because of the new advancements in uh, chemotherapy, that complications uh, don't arise as much from the primary lesion. So you can proceed with doing the liver resection itself. Those who advocate liver resection first, um, if resection is necessary. They can't uh, survive um, surgery because of how much um, has to be resected. 
is because their survival is not de determined by um, the primary lesion, but because of the liver itself. And oftentimes, uh, as Wanto would say, you know, it's the liver that kills them first, and which is true. So, um, and also, if we proceed with a primary colorectal resection, and if complications arise from that in individuals who have metastatic cancer, then you're significantly delaying their treatment with chemotherapy therapy as well as liver resection, sometimes weeks and sometimes months. And sometimes I've seen cases where um, they don't get to that area of, um, of treatment. Um, so then, um, and of course, argument, uh, Simultaneous metachronous, metachronous to uh, recover from pre resections, or if patients are too sick to undergo uh, dual resection, then you medically optimize them after each one. Um, previous studies have shown no difference between survival between those undergoing synchronous or metachronous resections. Um, and also, with those that undergo simultaneous, sometimes they do say um, morbidity is high when you have um, the individual undergo uh, a major hepatectomy in addition to a primary resection. Uh, so treatment of unreceptible liver metastases, Dr. Manji has already talked about conversion therapy, uh, making them resectable, and the uh, and chemotherapy agents nowadays has been shown to decrease from fifth, the downstage the lesions from 15 to 50 percent to make them um, resectable. And um, other studies have shown that those who undergo conversion therapy and resection, their five-year survival rate is equivalent to those who have only required resection alone. Adjuvant systemic chemotherapy um, has already been discussed, and, and also how um, chemotherapy for targeting microstatic, micrometastatic disease, although we aim for R0 resections with um, uh, cancer surgery. It's been shown that in addition with chemotherapy, you have, um, it's as the overall uh, survival is similar. So preoperative chemotherapy, there's a discussion as to whether to do so. And um, those are the benefits of doing, making them more resectable, limiting the hepatectomy, uh, treating micrometastasis micrometastases and also enabling evaluation of chemosensitivity of the disease and see if they will, as Dr. Manji said, benefit from surgery or not, if it's treatable or not. Let's see, recurrence and repeat resection. So the reason why um, adjuvant chemotherapy is often uh, encouraged is because there is such a high uh, recurrence rate in those who have uh, metastatic disease and has undergone resection. They say up to 55 to 60 percent will have recurrence within two years. And then, um, but the thing is that they can undergo re-resections re, uh, and their overall survival is similar to the first resection. So they can undergo second, third resection of their livers or um, the other um, metastases. And the only difficulty is, of course, surgery because you're not going into a virgin field anymore. Um, then this talks about ablative therapies and, and such that, you know, if you shrink the lesion enough, um, Dr. Uh, Sagani can e explain more about um, instead of resecting, then doing ablative therapy once chemotherapy has shrunk the lesions enough. Um, so metastatic colorectal can be treated uh, with combination of chemotherapy and resection. And it can um, be 10 to 20% of patients have been reported in the literature to be curative. Um, and then, and we've already talked about the recent advances, not only in the chemotherapy agents that are advancing, but also um, surgery itself. Because the majority of surgery, colorectal surgery now, uh, is done through uh, minimally invasive techniques robotically to decrease and prolong their um, their stay in the hospital. Actually, uh, colorectal surg um, surgery is moving forward to even be an outpatient mm -hmm. procedure itself. So patients don't necessarily have to stay in the hospital before if we have everything set up uh, appropriately, appropriately at home for patients. And so again, it's um, to reiterate, it's a um, multidisciplinary um, 
effort uh, to treat these difficult cases, um, and that the um, decision of whether uh, to undergo simultaneous resection first or having the liver first or the colon first depends on the condition of the patient um, as well. If the patient comes in uh, obstructed, then of course it's resection. If not, then we subject them to chemotherapy beforehand, see how they respond, how the liver um, and whether uh, the patient is amenable to um, treatment with surgery itself, and then post-operative treatment. Thank you. I'd like to welcome back to the podium Dr. Aswanto Sakani to provide an update on the surgical treatments of metastatic colorectal cancer to the liver. Dr. Sakani? Thank you again for uh, staying uh, so far. This is a uh, second talk from the last. So um, we will be talking about the update on surgical treatment of uh, metastatic colon cancer to the liver with minimal invasive uh, resection. So just, just, a, just a quick background. You know, obviously, liver cancer um, has two types, primary and metastatic. Um, the most common primary is HCC, obviously. However, the most common metastatic is the colon rectal cancer. And uh, you can see the pictures here. These all come from our, our operating room. This is a classical uh, adenocarcinoma. They look white, they look raised, they look hard. That's adenocarcinoma. So now colon, colon rectal liver metastasis, you can see here the cells from the colon cancer, they shed into the portal venous circulation. They get dragged into the liver because the liver is supposed to be the filter for those blood and they get stuck in the liver. And you can see here, if you put a camera into the abdomen and you can see this, you can almost certain that this cannot be anything else other than the um, metastatic uh, cancer to the liver. Interestingly, uh, people have done study, they put a syringe in the portal vein and draw blood and culture them. They got cancer cell in the portal vein. So now this is just a uh, uh, same uh, um, statistic, but I, I want to emphasize here is uh, at this point, obviously, R0 resection oncologically is the, is the primary curative option, which is a standard of care for patients with a stage 4 colon cancer liver metastasis. Ablation is alternative. At this point, in general, liver transplant is not indicated in the future, may have a role um, in the treatment of this uh, um, um, problem. Um, when it came to Tampa, interesting, a lot of oncologists they don't even refer the patient to a surgeon to, uh, to get resected, and they get chemo forever. Now, uh, unresectable patient, patient that has stage four, they never get to the surgeon, they have a poor outcome. The five-year survival is about 0%. It means they don't make it five years. Now, liver resection, when we add with the chemotherapy, it easily increases the survival from 0% to 60% in five years. So, this is actually a very easy question to ask for a patient. Do you want to be resected or not? Because now five years, you're still going to be around about six months of time. Without surgery, you probably won't make it. So for, for them, it's, it's an easy decision to make. Um, the morbidity and mortality from liver resection also decreases significantly in the last 20 years. It used to be, what Rosemary always say when he was a resident in Chicago, they always put the resident at the bedside after an open hepatectomy to watch the patient. So they park the residents there in case the patient bleeds overnight. I mean, right now, we just put the patient somewhere and they do fine. Um, so the mortality now is like 0.3%. This is because we have improved the instrument, knowledge, critical care, everything has got better to a point we can do it minimally invasively. Now, this is, I think, a very important slide. This is the patient who have all the treatment, surgery, chemotherapy, the survival is much better than the patient who have chemotherapy alone. And this is patients who are not treated. Obviously, the patient should be treated, right? But the question is, do you want to pick this line or this line? Obviously, this line. So um, it's clear that the multimodality, including surgery, in, in addition to chemo and radiation uh, by the uh, uh, IR, will be the best uh, optimal approach for the patient. Uh, Five-year oncological outcomes. 
comparing uh, open versus minimal invasive, they're actually equal. You know, a couple of years ago, there's always a criticism about uh, minimal invasive. People said, well, if you don't have your hand in there, the tumor resection is not as good because you miss tumors, you don't feel it, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that controversy has resolved in, in, the, in the hepatic uh, uh, conferences. Five-year oncology so far is the same, even on randomized trial. So now, uh, if every specimen goes to pathology again. Uh, we are very religious at getting a frozen section. And um, for patients who have a narrow margin, we try to get more margin as much as possible. This is especially important for a KRAS patient. Dr. So Manji mentioned the KRAS patient get chemotherapy before. From, from surgical perspective, if you have a patient with KRAS positive, the margin needs to be a centimeter. If you give the patient less than a centimeter, KRAS positive, that will recur. This is a, a literature that we published, combined colon and liver resection. Uh, we have done the, probably about 45 of this. And actually, they, they do quite well. Um, they have a single operation, they have a single recovery, and they can go back to the chemotherapy earlier. So instead of having colon surgery, take a month to recover, go, go back to the liver surgery, another month to recover, they'll be missing three months, right? So if we combine together, as long as it's safe and feasible, they only have one delay, which is one recovery for both. So if, if this is feasible, there's no question this should be done like the data before. Now, how to do, it's a bit te technical now, how to do liver surgery? The options are open, laparoscopic, robotic, and I put number four is ablation. And we can talk about it uh, a bit later with the radiology as well. Why minimally invasively? You can see here, this is like what Dr. Leone mentioned before. This is the car sign. Mercedes-Benz insertion is great. <laughs> it's great for the surgeon because we have full access to the liver. It's very easy to flip the liver back and forth. Um, however, it is obviously a very invasive procedure and um, lots of mobility come from the incision. Now, this is a minimally invasive operation, small incision, dot, 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 and uh, we can do the operation the same way. Now, why minimally invasive? Because there have been many publications, specifically in liver surgery, that says minimally invasive will bring to lower blood loss, less transfusion. Uh, as we know, if you transfuse the patient, the outcome oncologically is not as good because the cancer recurrence is higher when you transfuse the patient blood. Uh, they, they, they can resume oral intake on positive day one, at uh, positive day zero. The patient cannot believe this. We tell them, you have a right hepatectomy, you drink clearly today. Um, in open operation, we wait for about two days or so. So less pain medication, obviously, uh, length of stay is shorter, uh, and wound complication is, I think, probably one of the biggest differences between open and minimal invasive. With the open operation, a lot of hernias as well, pain, abscess. With minimal invasive, the, the wound is just so small. Now, the, the advantage has been even tested in the randomized trial and these three guys, I met them about a week and a half ago in, in Milan. Um, this is his first trial, landmark paper, Annals of Surgery, of course, from Oslo. Um, they, they basically uh, proved that the minimal invasive is better in terms of 30-day uh, complication rate, length of stay is shorter, and less narcotic pain medication. So this is the way to go as long as there's expertise in the center. Knowing the liver anatomy is obviously important. Um, now, patient come to the office, they say, doctor, can I have that operation or, or I cannot have that operation? Well, this is, this, is, this is what determine whether you can have the operation or not. Tumor location, tumor size, the distance from the vital structures, and the experience of the team. Tumor location, some of the tumor are very, very, very difficult to get. They're in a segment A, it's very deep in the liver, sometimes it's not possible to do it minimally invasively. Tumor size. Patients do come with an 18-centimeter tumor like this big. To do it minimally invasive it probably doesn't make sense, so those cases get, get, get done open. Fatal structures, if the tumor involves the portal vein, we have to cross clamp the portal vein, do some vascular action, that gets to get done open as well. This is how the uh, uh, OR is set up. Uh, you can see here the port placement, very clean, um, no open operation here. This is a little video of how the liver surgery is done. This is something that we did not uh, imagine uh, years ago. 
because as you know, uh, hepatic resection is very aggressive operation. Now we can do this with um, uh, minimally invasive. Um, the robot again has all the instrument that we need to cut the liver, uh, prepare for the uh, uh, inflow vascular control. You know, the recipe of liver surgery is we have to know the anatomy. So we, we, we close off the blood vessels that goes to the liver to be resected. So then everything can be, uh, can be done in the bloodless fashion. And you can see here, this is the vena cava sitting right here. You know, when I was a resident, everyone was like, oh my God, don't go to the vena cava minimally invasively. If you put a hole, what happened? Well, we actually have put many holes in the cava here. <laughs> so we even published a paper one time in uh, HPBA about um, technique of uh, cava bleeding control robotically. So um, it, it is something that I think is very doable uh, to be done without having to convert the patient. Again, uh, uh, hyalur dissection, uh, I show you in the classical tumor before, even those very, very small vessels, bile duct, we can actually dissect them robotically, put a suture, just like a no, doing an open operation. And this is quite routine um, um, that we do it here. So this is all uh, uh, very doable with, um, with the way we do it here. And uh, as far as I know, we are uh, almost the only center that performed the major hepatic recession in, in, Flo in state of Florida, actually. Um, now, this is how we cut the liver. We use uh, uh, electrocautery for open operation. Uh, we also use some electrocautery for a, a robotic operation. You have a, the, there's an ultrasound that we use to look at the location of the vein so we can actually preserve them. And um, you can see here the, the major trunk of the vein. We use a staple to, uh, to disconnect them. That will uh, lead us with um, very minimal blood loss and everything is uh, clean. This is the specimen, this is about 10 centimeters. You, you, you see the length of this is about 15 centimeters. So this, this, this tumor came out uh, through a robotic approach. So even big tumor, especially if they are in a favorable location, can be done minimally invasively. So now a bit of ablation. Uh, we shared it with the radiologist uh, colleague as well. I do send patients to have ablation with them as well. If I don't think they need a diagnostic laparoscopy, I have uh, a Morgan or a Crusader do it. If they need the ablation intraoperative with, abla with the resection, and I, I, I perform them. However, it is important to know that ablation has a size limitations. I many times get a referral from a primary doctor or oncologist. They said, the patient has a six and a half centimeter tumor. Can you ablate them? It is actually a wrong question because they should not be ablated. It's way too big for ablation. The tumor will recur. The ablation is good when the tumor is about three to four centimeters, not, not larger than that. And if the patient have a multiple tumors, to resect all of them, sometimes it's not possible. The patient got no liver left. So sometimes you have to resect the, the peripheral one, we wedge this out, and the deep one you, you ablate. By doing that, we preserve as much as parenchyma as possible, and the patient can live with the tumor-free status. This is the ablation, how it works. We have the machine here. I've already, I also have a machine, so we have two machines. And uh, we heat up the tumor, liver tumor, and kill them and they have a quite good uh, survival afterwards. Now, this is just to share what we have done here. We actually have done about 700 liver surgeries since I came. Um, we have done, out of those 650 cases, we have done 400 of them robotically. This is, I'm showing you the experience of 300, first 300, this, this, this graph from like maybe a year and a half ago or so. But you can see we do all kinds, colon cancer, this is a biliary uh, neoplasia, uh, HCC, um, uh, cysts, gallbladder cancer, some gist, you know, um, uh, isolated uh, uh, gastric cancer that goes to the liver gist. They have a one to two lesion in the liver, doing well. The answer is to cut it up. Um, some uh, intrahepatic bile duct cancer. This is the cholangiocarcinoma intrahepatically, neuroendocrine tumor, hepatic adenoma they all get hepatic resection. So this is a um, uh, dis description of uh, difficulty of the operation. So each of the cases that's got done here, we put them on a database. We have a very, uh, uh, I think we have a strong research program here. So each of the cases get assigned difficulty score. So we mark the patient from patient number one to patient number 650. So we have, um, um, we can track the difficulty of cases. And you can see here, we're actually doing more and more difficult cases as we go because those referrals are hard. This is a summary of uh, 300 patients, first cohort 100, second cohort another 100, third cohort another 100, 
the outcome is quite reasonable. The average time for a hepatic resection is about uh, three hours, and the blood loss is about maybe 100 to 200 cc, not more than 200. Length of stay for a ma minor resection, uh, they can be as, as low as two days. For a major resection, formal right, formal left, uh, usually about three to five days at the most. This is much better than open. Open means to stay for a week or so. We, we published uh, papers, of course, for uh, uh, education. And um, uh, this is a little conclusion. So a liver resection provides chance for cure for patients. Uh, bilateral tumor on right and left side, it does not mean unresectability. This is the second fact that probably I learned when I came to Florida. We go to tumor board, whatever, they said, well, the patient have a both sides of the, of the tumor, of the liver has tumor in it. One on the left, one on the right. It means they are unresectable. It's actually violate the standard of care. That patient needs to be resected. Um, uh, the goal is obviously a R0 margin. A minimal invasive, it can be done, it's better. And again, experience matter with this um, a type of resection. This is just a, a short video for you to enjoy here. This is a big tumor on the right side. This video is probably about three, four years ago. So this is a lymphadenectomy. And you can see here, we, um, we try to uh, uh, get the uh, control to the uh, vessels. We um, uh, place a little uh, silk suture around it. This is the portal vein uh, being isolated. Uh, just like doing an open operation. We mark where we're gonna cut. So this is a right partial right hepatectomy for a, a neuroendocrine tumor, I think. And uh, we have the ultrasound. They said he touched it as ultrasound. And that guide us to uh, where to land the uh, knife so we can have uh, uh, enough margin. We place two stitches on both sides just to kind of expose the liver and open book the liver. And you can, um, uh, you can see here, we, we cut the liver in a, in a quite bloodless fashion. There's a vascular clamp, there's a bulldog vascular clamp. People do it for kidney transplant as well. And you can see here, we, uh, we, we put some staple to close the bile duct, so that they don't leak bile because operatively. And then um, sometimes you have to apply maybe one or twice. And um, as, you, as you can see here, we are um, uh, almost finished with the operation. This operation takes about maybe three hours or so. The tumor's uh, size is about six centimeter. The patient's doing well, five years out. Um, he is a priest from uh, Newport Ritchie. I think this is the end of the uh, talk. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Dr. Eckerd, um, Dr. Morgan Eckerd. Dr. Eckerd is a fellowship trained interventional radiologist and board certified by the American Board of Radiology. He is an active member with the Society of Interventional Radiology. He is currently the radiology department chair at Advent Health Tampa, specializing in interventional oncology, as well as percutaneous biliary intervention and endovascular post-surgical care. Please help me welcome our final speaker of the day to the stage to discuss radiology techniques for patients with unresectable bilobar liver metastasis. So if I'd have known uh, this once I was going to put all of those great videos in there, I would have punished you all with just endless angiograms. <laughs> and if I'm invited next year, that's what I intend to do. <clears throat> All right, so for any talk that I do, um, radiologists were always proud of our history because we kind of came along a lot later than you know the rest of the specialties. Um, this guy pretty much gets the credit for the first embolization. Of course, it wasn't a liver, it was a, an AVM, but uh, he was an Egyptian guy. He came and worked at Columbia University in New York. <clears throat> and this was back in kind of the, the heyday or the beginning of when catheter-based therapy was kind of coming on, and it was, it was like driving race cars, you know. Uh, so. so liver-specific embolization. Now, I know that said 1968. Um, that says 1965 for yttrium-90, and that's true. But that was an embolic. That was just a direct delivery via the common hepatic artery. Uh, and there were only five cases of it. But 
That was the first time yttrium 90 was delivered to the liver or to that side of the celiac axis. Uh, taste, transarterial chemo, 1974, gel foam. That really didn't work out much more than that's a temporary fix, and we usually use that for trauma, uterine bleeding, because it only lasts about two weeks. So for a short comparison, we have bland. That's just particles, period. That started out as polyvinyl alcohol. Those are not circular. They're irregular particles. Um, and you're basically just blocking off at the proximal arterioles, period. You're just disrupting the, the, the blood flow and causing ischemia to the tumor. Uh, sometime in the early 70s, they started injecting lipiodol um, because that was embolic in itself. And then they began mixing doxorubicin, and then later on, sometimes a combination of that or alone ir irinotecan. Um, and they would mix that in a, in a slurry, and you would inject that into the tumor, and then follow it up with uh, gel foam torpedoes uh, to keep it from leaking out. And that's actually, uh, to this very day, still done at some very uh, big academic centers, particularly Northwestern. Uh, and they, they combine that because it'll act as a marker. The lipiodol, well, you can see it on CT, and then you can uh, go back and ablate that. Gives you a target. Um, drug eluting beads, um, those are, that's basically taste, but they soak the beads in typically doxorubicin, same concept as bland, and then of course radioembolization, and there are two products on the market that we'll talk about. One is more embolic, and one is more like actual directed radiotherapy. So. Alternative means. Uh, one interesting thing is that, and this is still being studied, is uh, putting iodine-131, like they give to ablate thyroids, putting that in lipiodol and sending that to the liver. It hasn't had, it hasn't really caught on. And then, of course, Y90, uh, glass or resin microspheres. So glass or resin with the therospheres uh, made by BTG, and by the way, I have no disclosures. Um, made by BTG, uh, the spheres are smaller and they're glass, and the Y90 is like uh, put in while they're making <clears throat> the spheres. Uh, Surtex is a resin microsphere, and then they take the resin microspheres and agglutinate the, the radioactivity to the spheres, and that, that changes the amount that you can deliver. And also, you'll see in a minute. This, um, these are just microspheres next to a human hair here. This is usually what the vial looks like. That's a therospheres vial. So, you know, just a little bit of anatomy. You know, we've, we've had a lot of it today. Everyone has like basically taken everything I have to say about uh, classifications and appropriateness criteria and everything like that. Most, all of these are coming to us as end users. Um, they, you know, we don't have our own clinic here right now. Um, we, we get all of our cases from Dr. Sakandi. So they've, at this point, already been through multidisciplinary committee. They've already been determined that, you know, by multiple people that this is probably the best, at least a best part of, of, of the overall therapy that the, the patient's going to get, you know, chemo, surgery, whatnot. Um, so Y90 is a, it's a, a pure beta emitter. Uh, so the best way I could put that is it's, it's a really strong radioactive material, but it's like throwing a bowling ball. It doesn't go very far. So um, like if you threw a bowling ball, it would crush whatever is like right in front of you, but it's, you know, it'd be hard to throw a bowling ball toward the other side of the room. It's going to do the damage right around where you put it. <clears throat> so like, like I said, average penetration, 2.5 millimeter. That's, that's, and uh, half-life is 64 hours. That's, that's a high half-life. All right, so you know we do these procedures in the angio suite. Typically a, um, a common femoral access. Um, there's more happening here 
than than you might think. Um, you know, this is a two-stage procedure for Y90, a one-stage for, for Tace and Bland, of course. But for Y90, you need to do a mapping, what we call mapping. Um, you have to go in and do some pretty extensive angiography uh, to make sure that there are no blood vessels that the spheres could reflux into, which might cause ulceration of the bowel. That's, that's the main reason of the mapping. In addition to, that's where you're going to deliver, uh, we deliver Technetium 99 MAA. You may be familiar with that because we give it for um, VQ scans for PE. Uh, it's a weak, weak radioactive material, um, but it distributes the same. Um, and then subsequent to that, you can see where it went, whether it went to the bowel, whether it went too much to the lungs. Uh, you generate what's called a lung shunt fraction. And if that is above 20%, pretty much the patient is not a candidate for Y90. So pretty much we're looking at the celiac axis. Um, we're going to look at flow, just, just visibly look at flow, pulse contrast like we would when we get into the target area and see, you know, is there reflux. There are two <coughs> arteries on here that, so in, in the past, traditionally with Surtex, you would always, always, always uh, coil off the GDA. Um, two other arteries that can cause a problem are right gastric and the, uh, the gallbladder, the cystic artery. Uh, with the uh, advent of Therospheres, because the spheres are so much smaller, um, typically we don't coil off the GDA as standard anymore. If you're going to do Surspheres, Surtex, which is still indicated for some things over Therospheres, uh, you, would, you would always coil off the GDA because the size of the particles are, are much larger. And this is a hepatic arteriogram. Um, I don't know if you all can appreciate this small artery coming around here, and then around here it's kind of circular. Uh, you know, the, the, the old schoolers call that the light bulb. Um, that's that's this is a, like a standard typical HCC right there, like on angiogram. What they've done here is they've done a conventional taste with lipiodol and whatever chemotherapy they wanted to mix with it. So it's stained. It's going to look like that forever. That's not going to absorb. Um, and that's why, to this day, if you get people who are unresectable, uh, not candidates for surgery, uh, you have a lot of people. When I was in fellowship, we had a lot of uh, cirrhotic patients who it was almost like playing like whack-a-mole with their HCCs. We would scan them regularly. One would pop up, and what we would do, we call taste ablate. We would taste it, and then take them back like a week later and ablate it. And they've even developed angio suites now um, in the radiology sense we call hybrid that there's a common gantry and the gantry goes like from the C-arm into a CT scanner, not just cone beam, but into a CT scanner and you do it all in one shot. So this is a mapping uh, MAA scan. So Basically, you know, and this is the, this is where our nuclear medicine technologists are, are fantastic. Uh, we have a great nuke med uh, team here. Uh, so this is where you've injected the MAA. They're going to take the counts from this, take the counts from this, come up with the calculation, and determine how much of that is being shunted via the hepatic vein to the lungs. Because if it's over 20%, the likelihood that you're going to get some radiation complication in the lungs of fibrosis is it, like the curve is like that <clears throat> at 20%. If it's at 15%, you, you typically three quarters or half the dose. So post procedure, post scan, we compare this to pre scan to see how successful we are. Uh, Bremstrahlung, does anybody know what that means? Breaking radiation. Um, so when the uh, Y90 particles smash into each other or whiz past each other, um, they, they tend to cause each other to curve, which shoots off uh, a gamma ray, shoots off an X-ray. And you can pick that up. That can be picked up on, on a nuke med scan. Um, and so we'll do a post. This is kind of like an old school one. 
but you know we combine it with uh, this is what I'm hoping to do here it, combine it with pet, like a pet style CT so you can get some actual like spatial resolution anatomy to see where it went you know to see your how accurate you were all right if there's anything that I can this is my only soapbox I'll ever have uh, this is important for anybody who's referring or anybody who is working up a patient outside of Advent is the pre-procedural imaging. <clears throat> so MRI is, is preferred. It's superior. You get multiple phases. Um, you get uh, phases, what's called restricted diffusion, uh, which is often indicative of, you know, badness, abscess, often, you know, cancer. Uh, I won't go into the physics of that. But the only problem with MR is it's very susceptible to motion. So if you have a patient who you can just see when you walk in the room that they're not going to be able to be still, they're claustrophobic, they're nervous, then you know your choice would be to either do MRI with anesthesia and then the risks that come along with that, and we believe me, we do a lot of that. Or, like Dr. Secundi mentioned earlier, the triple phase liver mass protocol, um, which is much less susceptible to, uh, to motion. And it's good. However, MRI, like I said, provides the diffusion weighted sequence, which can often pick up early, um, like surrounding micromets. So, MRI is preferred, but. If you think that it's motion's going to be an issue, then I wouldn't even waste the time. So the goal in radioembolization, and I'm really going towards radioembolization because that's where it's going. I mean, as far as tumor shrinkage, trying to downstage somebody, shrink a tumor to get it away from everything else so, you know, surgical colleagues can cut it out. It's going toward radioembolization, like definitely. The goal is just uh, tumor necrosis, size reduction, but sometimes the total uh, treatment response time can take, you know, three months. So pre-procedural, oftentimes, like I said, these people are coming already from the surgeon's office. They've already been staged. They've already been worked up for their appropriateness or their ability to handle, you know, that radioactive treatment or that chemoembolization. But we, we do the same. We still do a standard consult and work them up. Uh, we usually use BCLC, uh, the Barcelona criteria. Uh, most of these patients fall in BCLCB. Remember that. Um, you know, rarely will, you, will we be doing a heavy embolization on a person who's a C, who has very low functional capacity, who doesn't get out of bed, who doesn't do ADLs, just because they're usually those people at that point in time, they're, they're eating up and, and, a, and, a, and a heavy hit is going to knock them out, might, might kill them. Uh, we give uh, IV antibiotics, uh, broad gram negative coverage. So this is something that we still do here. Uh, where I did fellowship, we didn't typically do this. We didn't typically admit people overnight, but we do that here. Um, we admit them overnight, you know, and it's a case-by-case -case basis. If you have a particularly sick person, you're going to admit them overnight and make, make sure that they don't get, you know, acute liver failure or, or have some other, you know, acute problem. Pain control, it's very rare that they need a PCA. Usually, um, you can send them the next day. On uh, Cipro is, is the standard, uh, like gram negative. Uh, oral pain meds, you know, PR and Percocet. A Medrol dose pack often helps, particularly for the more functional patients who are just, you know, raring to get up and get back to their life. They, they gives them a little energy boost because the radiation does knock them down in the first seven days. And then 30 days of a PPI, that may be just window dressing. Because if you've given somebody an ulcer externally uh, to their bowel, I don't know necessarily that PPI is going to help, but it's something that we just still do. So complications, uh, bioloma, abscess, 
radioembolization induced liver disease. That's I can sum that up by just saying um, acute liver failure, like within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, radiation induced cholecystitis, like I mentioned, if we do the uh, if we do the mapping and you see a big fat cystic artery, you're going to have to plan for that. Whether it means getting further out or coiling it proximally to allow it to, you know, recanalize, which it will. Um, but just to, to stop up the osteum of it so beads don't go down it. Uh, pneumonitis, dermatitis, those are very rare. So uh, clinical indications, I think we've pretty much been through that. Um, we do look at the liver enzymes. Um, if you've got high bilirubin, uh, bad protein, uh, bad enzymes, and of course, again, it's on a case-by-case -case basis and it'll always be discussed in, in MDC, but those are things that are precursors or harbingers of this, this patient might not do very well after a big hit uh, of radiation or chemotherapy. Okay, so here's the big difference. Um, so glass, resin, really these numbers, I lifted this off of another presentation, really these numbers should be closer to 20 for therospheres and 60 for the resin. So that's, that's actually a really big difference. And also the amount of radiation you can deliver. Uh, what you can deliver with therospheres is, I don't know, you all do the math. 2550. Uh, it, it's a big, it's really big difference. And you can be much more subselective with glass spheres than you can. Um, the amount of radiation you can give per dose, meaning like per particles, vastly different. Um, the delivery process of the glass spheres is very simple. It's one push or one per cardiac cycle push, the beads are gone, and then you're just clearing the microcatheter with four more pulls. The Surtex spheres, uh, the box is complicated. Um, you have to intermittently check flow, and you have to use dextrose and contrast to do that. So you're, you have to do a bead phase, and then you have to do an air phase. The whole procedure takes much longer than the glass spheres. And uh, just to go back, uh, it is now FDA approved for colorectal nets, whereas it wasn't before. So these are three trials. Um, I'm not a great research scientist. Uh, the medical oncologist and surgical oncologist are probably familiar with all these trials, all these trials in some way involved um, administration of Y90 um, in some adjunct way to you know, treatment. So these are three studies, uh, one for HCC, one for colorectal mets, one for, this is just the first one, uh, and one for cholangiocarcinoma, that one's not very impressive. But uh, this one's from 2022. Um, this was, uh, yes, yeah, is a trace. I didn't miss one, did I? No. Okay, uh, so this was a smaller study, 38. Um, but at the interim, they ended the study because the tear arm was doing so much better than the TACE arm. So they stopped it. And of course, all these slides, I guess, will be available. I don't want to just read off numbers to you all. This was a big one. This is a radiology-backed one. This is the resin uh, trial. 498 uh, patients. That's, that's, that's big for me, for us. Um, longest overall survival throughout this whole study. The, the main takeaway of this was that it was when tear was part of a second line therapy. And then this is uh, the most recent JVIR uh, for cholangiocarcinoma. Um, there's a pretty sharp drop off at a year. 
uh, if this was like an only treatment. So um, probably we have a ways to go with this and solo treatment for flange carcinoma, but the likelihood that we're going to be doing that, you know, is, is, is pretty low here because uh, we have, you know, great surgeons and we're just, you know, as interventional radiologists, we're the digital anatomists, proceduralists, you know, we help out. And uh, that's it.